Do you need to find the skeleton? How would you tell people that this happens? You personally, how would you tell this happens? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is some time for something we have not done in a very long time. Um, as you guys know, this is uh, kind of a channel that has been always incorporated as part of the whole Great Debate community, which uh, used to be about debates, isn't any longer. It's about just talking about stuff, having fun, playing games, whatever it is on the Great Debate community channel. But today we are actually going to have what's constitutive of a debate for all practical purposes. I call them discussions, but eh, potato, potato. But it's going to be on one of my favorite subjects. Evolutionary theory, yay! Okay, so uh, long story short, we have Dapper Dino in here, and we have uh, Finding Truth uh, Ahmed, and they're going to take uh, actually diametrically opposite positions in here. Not this, hey, look, I don't believe you. You haven't made your burden of proof. None of that nonsense. We're going full bore. We're going two people having their own arguments, own reasoning, and their own presentations. Um, so let me introduce you guys first. Um, I'm going to start off with Dapper. Uh, if people don't know you, where the hell have you been? But uh, Dapper, what up, man? Oh, you know, just uh, having a nice Sunday morning. Figured I would talk about uh, evolution, mutation, descent with modification, all that good stuff. Oh, I got to turn to you. Uh, okay. Wow, that was loud. <laughs> oh, sorry. Ooh, sorry about no, that. No, not your fault. Not your fault. Um, it's just that uh, I haven't said loud. So. Uh, you know, it's, when you're a dinosaur, it's very easy to just blast people's eardrums off because you're very loud. There you go. It's all it's all normalized now. But I had to kick you down yeah. 15 freaking dB. That's a lot. Anyways, uh, so uh, tell people who you are and your position on this um, and, and so, why we're doing this. Yep, I'm Dapper Dino. Uh, my channel is linked in the description. Uh, uh, the, sorry, the description, if I can talk. I mostly cover things like um, creation evolution, but every once in a while there's a little bit of other pseudoscience in there. I've done some stuff about why homeopathy is nonsense. Um, <clears throat> I do uh, a live show every Tuesday with uh, my co-host, Ben Tovind, No Relation, where we uh, make fun of uh, Ken Tovind, basically. Well, we don't really make fun of him. We, we live debunk him while I get progressively more inebriated, um, except every second Tuesday of the month is actually Eric with Erica, where Gut Sick Gibbon comes on, and we talk about uh, basically the same stuff, but we give Ben Tovind a break. Thursdays, I have a scripted video that comes out every week. Uh, and then every once in a while on Saturday, I will do another stream or video. Uh, I'm currently working on a leading Earth creationist uh, video for uh, hopefully not this Saturday, but the next one maybe, although maybe this Saturday. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. I am, of course, taking the affirmative on the question, is descent with modification through, through mutation and natural selection true? Awesome. I like that. I, I like when take, people take a position. All right. Anyways, we also got Finding the Truth in here, who I don't know very well, but has been a member of the Great Debate community on Facebook. Um, seems to be very polite. Never had an issue with them. Don't know his positions very much, but uh, we'll give it a go. So, uh, Ahmed, what do you got to say for yourself and what you do? What are you going to argue with here? All right. So uh, I'm a, I run the Finding Truth channel, and um, I'm an engineer, an electronics and communications engineer by education. I also did my master's um, courses uh, related to computer science and uh, computer engineering. I have a master's in business, and I have four years education in uh, Islamic theology, um, 30 years experience in computer science field. So I work with design all the time. Uh, I design systems and implement them. I've been an executive for 20 years in transnational um, uh, corporations. And I think that evolutionary theory um, suggests that all what we see around us comes through randomness and natural selection. Uh, a random process is a blind process and natural selection is blind to its objective. There is no objective function. It contradicts with everything that I have been taught in engineering. And um, I just find it um, uh, uh, not logical at all. Um, it is one of the subjects I've been fascinated uh, with since my teens. So I've been looking into this for like uh, uh, 30 years. Um, and eventually I thought I will, I will put up a channel and I will discuss uh, religion and I will discuss also science. And I will see where they reconcile and where they don't. Um, I feel that there is a great deal of systemic bias in the field of biology and that the matter of evolutionary thinking is extending 
not only in the matter of origin of species, but also in the origin of life or abiogenesis, even in the origin of uh, uh, the whole universe. And uh, I think this position is, 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 is more or less spawned by philosophical naturalism and manifesting itself in a methodological and natural, in methodological naturalism aspect uh, in science, which is okay. Yet, uh, invoking something like randomness answers no questions whatsoever. And my position is that this is uh, false. It is flat out false. Um, uh, um, the one thing that I don't like about it is the random, the random part, that, that random mutations are what is driving innovation. And that natural selection can fix that by filtering uh, the right uh, uh, mutations in and filtering the bad ones out. Uh, my argument is that this is not possible. And I'm going to give uh, uh, plenty of examples about that. Awesome. Uh, on the theologi theological side, yeah, on the theological side, I think that, uh, so I'm a Muslim, yeah? So um, I think that uh, in general, um, whether you are uh, following an Abrahamic religion, a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim, or other religions that believe that um, there is God who wants to be found, I think that God who wants to be found uh, is not, um, it does not make sense given that uh, this is the position of religion, that God obscures himself to the extent that when we look at him, when we try to find him, as far as what, uh, how life was created, we find randomness. I think this does not make sense. It doesn't add up to um, uh, the, the, the position of religion about a God that wants to be found and worshipped. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah. yeah, that was a pretty good intro. Uh, so you're a smart dude. We'll, we'll, we're going to just give you that. Okay. Um, so, Dapper, Thanks. you have a lot. You have a, you, you have a challenge here, man, man. So, you know, make the evolutionists proud because you got to get that, that NASA shill books here. So um, we're going to start you off first. You're going to be the one doing your first presentation. I'm going to give you around 15 minutes, give or take, um, timed. Uh, but, of course, it's not going to be, you know, inflexible. So go ahead and, and start your presentation, present, and uh, let's see what you got. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me here, Steve. Uh, Ahmed, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I appreciate it. It's always fun to have a chance to have a uh, hopefully polite and civil discussion on these topics. Uh, so I actually want to start out talking about the things that I am not here to uh, debate, because I always think that it's important to get out of the way uh, what the debate isn't about so that we can focus on what it is about. So one of the things, one of the things it's not about is the origin of the universe. Uh, you know, evolution, descent with modification is compatible with a large number of possibilities for that, including many of them involving gods and miracles or anything like that. <clears throat> We're also not here really to talk about the origin of life because the origin of life, the first life form obviously can't have descended via mutation and natural selection from an earlier life form because it was the first one. So we're also not here to talk about that because the process of um, mutation natural selection doesn't explain abiogenesis. We would have to look to other areas for that. But since this is about modification through mutation natural selection, no abiogenesis. Um, in fact, while I do plan on addressing things like general common descent, even that is not technically part of the discussion necessarily. So for instance, if it turned out that um, all birds were created separately from all mammals, but that all mammals shared common, uh, common ancestry, that would in fact confirm descent with modification through mutation and natural selection. So it's not even strictly necessary to argue for universal common ancestry, although I may end up touching on those areas. So I just wanted to set that up as a uh, very important things. I also don't really um, intend to discuss theological implications of this, other than to say, if the science, if what mainstream science says is true, then it does preclude a few, but not all, theological uh, positions. So if you find that troubling for your theological position, I'm, I'm not going to try to modify um, you know, mainstream science in order to make it fit your theology. I think it is the onus is on you to modify your theology to make it fit with reality. Um, <clears throat> so that is why I do not plan on addressing theology very much. Uh, so then we come to the actual topic, descent with modification through mutation and natural selection. So first we have, we're going to go in order. <clears throat> so we have descent. So this is something that is, is obvious to everyone. It has been for thousands of years, probably tens of thousands of years. Uh, organisms descend from earlier organisms who are their parents, or in the case of, you know, single cell organisms, 
you know, the one cell splits into two daughter cells. And um, you can think of the original cell as the parent, and the two new daughter cells are the uh, descendants. So I don't think there is any debate that descent happens. Now, the next part is modification. And we're going to take modification and mutation together. So <clears throat> while many mutations will not actually cause any change to the phenotype or the actual way the organism uh, exists in terms of its size and shape and interaction with the environment and chemical processes that go on within it, some of them will. We know this. We know this because uh, we've seen mutations in the wild and in the lab cause phenotypic differences. So then the next question is, OK, well, do mutations occur during the process of descent? And the answer is also obviously yes, we can measure it happening. We can take a look at over the generations, we can watch mutations accumulate in the genomes of organisms. We can, we've done it with humans, we've done it with many model organisms, lots of bacteria, all these things. So we know <clears throat> that descent with modification through mutation happens. And then the last question is, does natural selection filter out some of these mutations? Well, we know this is the case for a number of reasons. One of the best ones is simply statistics. So for instance, you can take a look at what's called a pedigree mutation rate, which is simply the mutations that are accumulated from parent to child. But if you then, <coughs> sorry about that, if you then go further generations, so you take parent to child to grandchild, and then go to great grandchild, and so on and so forth, the rate of these accumulating mutations start to go down. And one of the reasons for this is that if these mutations are detrimental, then they will be unlikely to be passed down. And so over generations, that mutation rate is lower to what's called the phylogenetic replacement rate. And the biggest factor in that is going to be natural selection. But we can also watch natural selection happen. Uh, one of the most famous examples of natural selection happening, which is uh, in the peppered moths in England. So we know that the melanistic morph of the peppered moth, which made them black, didn't really exist before about 1820. We can tell this both with genetic clocks in terms of just actually taking genetic samples and looking back to how far back the mutation is likely to go, but also because we don't get historical records of them appearing from naturalists until around the 1820s. So we have two independent methods of saying this was a novel mutation. And then we have the observation that the ratios of melanistic to, uh, I suppose, original morph moths flip radically while, before the Clean Air Act was established in Great Britain, which cleaned up the soot from the trees, essentially. And then when they started clearing up from the trees, the ratio flipped back. So we know we had descent with modification because we have a novel mutation. And we know that natural selection caused the um, general distribution of the different morphs of these uh, moths to change. So we have the whole thing. There is really no question as to whether or not natural selection causes changes in an organism through filtration of these negative alleles. But we also have other examples. For instance, um, new mice populations in the last few decades have started to enter into the sandy beaches around Florida. And while the original populations tended to all be black or brown, there is a rare agouti morph, which ends up with them having a much lighter color. And in that area in Florida, that has been heavily selected for. And now light sandy colored mice predominate because they are better at blending in with the sand dunes. Uh, but we also have other examples where we can trace back mutations around things like ring species. Now, there is no perfect ring species in the world, but we have things that come very close. And so we know that <clears throat> essentially, if you go to adjacent populations, they can interbreed and we can trace back the mutations causing it. But when you get to the two ends of the ring, they tend not to be able to breed. And so this is going to be a result of at least descent with modification through mutation. Now, we also have things like, uh, and I know uh, Ahmed is aware of this, uh, we have the Valensky long-term experiment with E. coli. And in that, not only do we have descent with modification through natural selection, granted the environment itself is artificial, but the selection is not. Humans are not specifically picking out bacteria to propagate. But in this, not only do we have the morphological evidence of the changes in time, but we also, because samples are taken of each population, we actually have essentially like an actual historical record of the genome that can be revived to check on um, the actual genome, their performance, and things like that, which is how we found out that the citrate, we found out that there were two important mutations for citrate metabolism in the populations in an experiment that can undergo aerobic citrate uh, metabolism, which is in fact a defining characteristic of E. coli, that they can't do that. We also know of other instances in bacteria, such as uh, the production of nylonase. Uh, we know that nylonase wasn't really 
uh, produced until after the substance nylon and some time after the substance nylon was produced. And we found out that there were bacteria eating nylon in essentially nylon factory wastewater. And so again, we have mutation that is selected for through natural selection. We can also observe this in antibiotic resistance. And if we want to go to the fossil record to see um, modification, we have extremely good fossil records for many organisms, including both centrosaurian and chasmosaurian uh, neoceratopsians. We have an excellent fossil record for Paravian manoraptoran dinosaurs. We have an excellent fossil record for um, the human line, at least from the point of uh, Australopithecus going forward. Before that, it gets a little bit spottier, but that's still a very smooth transition there. Um, we have to the point of almost seeing every single generation, if you look at uh, the fossils going up through the vertical extent of the strata in diatomaceous earth, where we're getting all these diatoms, or if you're looking at um, the evolution of coccolithophores in limestone, you can see almost every single generation represented. So we know that descent with modification is happening. There really is no debate about that. And we know that it can occur through mutation. And we know that natural selection must filter these things because it is simply a mathematical inevitability that if organism A in, a, in the same population as organism B produces more offspring than B, overall, those genes will come to dominate or those alleles will come to dominate the genetics of the population over time if that um, situation persists, that A is consistently more successful than B because of natural selection. So I'm not really sure what argument can be put forth to say that descent with modification doesn't happen or that it is not affected by both mutation and natural selection. I see it as, it's almost a, it's as close to mathematical certainty as one could get without actually being in mathematics proper. All of the premises we know are true. Descent happens, modification happens, mo mutation happens, natural selection happens. I, unless you want to deny one of them, I don't know how we can say that the conclusion, that this, this statement here is false. Um, and really it's, I could go on with more and more examples. Um, you know, we know diversions time for things like Arctic hares versus the hares that live in other parts of North America. We know that they generally can't breed if they're far enough apart in the range. We can trace back the genetics. We can even trace back paleogenomics in some cases, all the way back into the Triassic to look at things like the mutations involved in taking the sort of basal tetrapod jaw configuration and turning it into the weird mammal jaw configuration. So even then, we actually have a good idea of exactly which mutations occurred in which genes that are conserved across vertebrates. And so I, I'm honestly kind of confused as to why someone would decide to take the negative in this. But I think with that, I'm just going to end it because I'm interested to hear uh, Ahmed's points and actually get into the discussion. Yeah. All right. You uh, actually had a little more time than uh, you had about five more minutes, but I guess you're going to um, relinquish the balance yeah, of your fine. time, which is fine. So you had about 10 minutes. Uh, Achman, you get the full amount, though. He's giving you the, the advantage here, man. He thinks you need like a handicap. So he's giving you 10 minutes to your 15. So make it make it to your advantage here, man. Show him up. <laughs> all right. It's all yours, yeah. man. So uh, thank you, uh, Dapa, for the uh, introduction. And uh um, it, it, it was uh, quite uh, uh, good comments. I took some remarks. I'm going to respond to your um, to your comments after I do uh, a brief um, uh, presentation. So I'm gonna share my um, uh, screen now. And we have um, some fun with the presentation. Okay. So uh, is, is it on now, uh, Steve? Can you see it? Hello? Yeah, okay. So, uh, here we go. I already introduced myself, so we can skip that. Uh, this is the address of my channel, um, so we can skip that. And let's first start by, by, by saying what's okay for me. So, I have no problem whatsoever with all established science that is causal, testable, and observable. This includes genetics, this includes inheritance, Mendelian inheritance, with all the recombination, everything. This includes the recently uh, discovered epigenetics within the um, couple of decades ago. This includes breeding, uh, genetic drift, natural and artificial selection, all sorts of adaptive responses. And in terms of mutation, I believe there is mutation, but um, they are predominantly deleterious. And um, 
maybe sometimes they can be neutral, but um, the observation, the evidence says that mutations are deleterious, and we are going to go through that in more detail. So now my background is engineering, and in engineering, we use science and art to serve human beings. So engineers are those guys who use science to create real things that work. And the, 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 the centerpiece of engineering is information. And engineering something starts by having an intent and having a purpose for that thing. And when you have a purpose for a thing, then you have a design for that thing that serves the purpose. And the design reflects uh, the information that is coming from your purpose. And then you, 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 you manifest that design into a set of instructions to build that thing. And, and when it is like a machine, then there are systems, and these systems have parts. And these parts are built to work together. And then you make operating instructions for these things to work. So if you're building a car, the car has the information that is the design of the car, but there is also the information that is, how are you going to use the car? And this information goes from the designer to the operator. So for you to operate the car, you need to receive an information from the designer, from the original equipment manufacturer, to be able to operate the car. Now, if you are creating a fully autonomous car, which is something that I think will be coming soon, you will need to give the operator um, less information. So we'll go into the car and tell the car, take me to Dallas. And the car then has to have a set of instructions so it is able to operate itself. And this information is the super set of information that the operator would have received. And when we look around us, we see those um, creatures that are manifesting this, these things. We see that there, are, there, is, there is general purpose for each creature. We see things like bacteria that are cleaning up every, everywhere. We see scavengers. We see plants that are feeding animals. We see a very big integrated system with subsystems of living things living in it. And we also see the extra set of information, which is quite amazing. So we don't just see a creature that moves, but we see a creature that has extra information about where it is going to. We see amazing things like birds that don't only know how to fly, but they can also use the magnetic um, uh, field of the Earth to make something like a GPS positioning for itself. And it knows that if it is going to migrate, it should migrate from this place to that place in that season. So it has this extra information about how to operate itself in the bigger thing. And this cannot make any sense unless everything is designed. And the designer is not only delivering information in the genetic material that is manifesting itself into a creature that is living, but also delivers, downloads information to these creatures so that they can operate themselves. And so we're, we're looking not only at cars, we're looking at autonomous cars. We're looking at much more than this. We're looking at cyborgs, cyborgs all around us, animal cyborgs. And then we're looking at humans. And this is totally, it's an information-centric thing that we see around us. And with our knowledge about what it takes to have this working, we need a processing system, we need programs, we need a database, and we need operating instructions, and we need integrated systems. And these things do not occur through any random process. There has never been an engineer, and there will not be an engineer, who will design something that works through randomness. We see that today, as engineers, for very sophisticated problems, we use algorithms like genetic algorithm, algorithms. We use algorithms that are very heavy on trial and error. 
But we give, we give these algorithms an objective function that represents the objective and the purpose of the designer. And those objective functions see where the design should go. So natural selection, which is totally blind, which has no sense whatsoever of what is the objective of any series of mutations, will have no idea about which mutations are really uh, to be picked. So natural mutation uh, selection cannot fix the randomness of mutations. Um, I have just, from the, my background as a communications and electronics engineer, uh, looking around me in nature, just this morning, jotting down um, what we are learning from uh, living things. And some of these inventions we have created long ago. And then we get struck that they are already existing in living things. And we modify our designs so that they work. The very late nanotechnology, we get shocked when we look at the, the, the uh, molecular biology level and we see those nanomachines inside of us. And none of those inventions has come to us uh, through a random uh, uh, thing. We have come through people who have purpose and intent and put together designs. And the existence of these things that are designed into living beings only show, if we look at how things are in operation, that those things are designed. They are not the product of any random, random process. I'm putting here things like radar, sonar, GPS, firmwares, information coding and decoding, error corrections, hard drives, neural networks. Even neural networks, when we're thinking of a very sophisticated calculation mechanism, we look into uh, how our synapses and, neural, uh, 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 and uh, neurons are working, and we imitate that so that we can get out with artificial intelligence. Uh, we have CCDs, fiber communications, cameras, um, bigger things like planes and submarines, microphones, uh, robots, nanotechnology. All of this are designs that are there already. Can this or can those, this not be explained by genetic material that gets random mutations and those random mutations will then survive uh, 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 one way or the other and then one mutation after one mutation? You have mutually constructive mutations. My position is that this is totally false, it's totally impossible, and it's totally absurd. I can, you know, go into discussions about mathematics, etc., but I would rather, as an engineer, take a different approach. Because as an engineer, if you tell me this thing will work this way, I will tell you, okay, show me. Show me. If it works this way, show me. So let's have an engineering approach to this. Let's have Let's have a hypothesis and let's advance the hypothesis and see if randomness, which is random mutation, combined with blindness, which is natural selection, can give us anything. Anything. Yes, natural selection uh, would, would, would naturally, uh, uh, because something that gets a beneficial mutation would reproduce more, uh, it will have a better chance for survival. But we're not talking about the chance for survival here. We're talking about one mutation that makes somebody will see uh, 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 the light and then another mutation that makes him see black and white and then another mutation that makes him see colors. And we're not talking about one mutation. We're talking about thousands and thousands of mutations. So if there is no system that sees an objective function that has a direction, th this is completely hopeless. But let's look at this. Um, I'm going to show here um, something. I'm not sure if the audience know some of these things but let's look at the latest of the latest of our technology the future the hope of humanity nanotechnology and and there are these things today uh, 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 that we, uh, we want to design to put into our bloodstreams or whatever nanobots and when we looked into molecular biology these things are already there i'll just show these glimpses one minute each almost and um they're just amazing. I will let them speak for themselves. So just a second. Uh, just to let you know, you're about five minutes or take, okay? Yeah. Thank you. If, if the... I know that Ahmed had earlier said that the video clips took about five minutes. So if he goes a little bit over just showing the video clips, I don't mind. All right. Thank you. All right. 
Uh, Thank you for that. While you're doing that, since you're looking for something, let me give acknowledgement to Rez Instance for the $50 super sticker. Thank you, Rez. Really appreciate it, man. Really appreciate it. Glad you're enjoying this. Let's do it. Go on. So can you guys see the, the screen now? I can. I can see that it's buffering. What, what's, what we're seeing now on the screen is this incredible thing. This is what is called a kinesin. And this is a molecule, a protein molecule, that is moving inside each and every cell of our body. This thing that is moving on two legs is a protein. And it's moving on uh, what's called a microtubule, and it's moving material around. And this is the kind of thing that we would dream of. This is a single molecule. Can this be a product of a random mutation? Now let's see what else this thing can do to just to appreciate what these things are. So here is another thing. And what we're looking at now is what this thing uh, does. It's, it's buffering a little now. And um, this, the, the guy that we're going to see is, is, is the guy who has actually discovered those things. And those things are all over the place in our bodies. And um, they, they, they do pretty amazing things because they are moving things around whenever we, we need them to move things around. And without them, we wouldn't survive. So, so, so this is uh, Ron Valley, and he, he, he's, he's talking about this. I think you cannot hear the, the voice. But this is how this uh, 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 um, molecule moves it performs these reactions uh, uh atp reactions and uh, uh it just it does four reactions and each reaction will make it lift a leg and put another leg and here's this thing moving small beads this is very microscopic and the great thing is that this thing which is the equivalent of a truck in the cell there's billions upon billions of them inside of us and they're moving things, and they're moving it at four times the efficiency of the best car that we have ever built. And, and if you consider the size, they would be even moving much more faster. And here is another example of what these things can do uh, from that other video. And I, I, I would really recommend that people would go to these videos and, and, and see them in full, because uh, I, I personally, I find them completely amazing. And um, yeah, that's, I'm not sure if it's showing this. I don't think it's showing it. Uh huh. Let's, let's see, the, see this one to appreciate the, the, the beauty of this. Let's see this thing in operation, uh, in, in, in making us who we are in, in, in the cell division. And what this does, this is something called the kineticore, and it is this um, process. These are the, the fine tubules that we have seen before, and these are the, 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 the these tubules are stretching uh, the, the the chromatids, the, the chromosomes, to split them. And there's this red signal that says, "I'm not ready yet," and you can see how these microtubules are building themselves up. And then you can see these amazing machines starting to move up the microtubules, carrying a signal. And then the signal, when the, chrom the, 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 the chromosome material is ready to split, the signal changes. And those kinesins and, and there will see other motors moving around, dynins, are, are going to carry the signal, physically carry the signal, carry the stop signal away and tell the cell that I'm ready to split. And then the splitting happens. And the first time I saw this, it brought tears to my eyes. This is super duper, super crazy, intelligent nanotechnology. And these guys, the dining is moving and the kinesin is moving, the long legs so that nobody, this is completely mind blowing. This is hyper sophistication. How does this thing occur in the cell? How can the first cell, uh, first eukaryote at least, 
have this kind of sophistication? Where did the information come from? How does something this sophisticated happen? When this thing fails, cell division fails, and you do not get an embryo, there is no life. There is, if there is no replication, there is no life. Life is complicated at its very basic level. It's not you know, that life was very simple and it became, became very sophisticated and there is a gradient. Life starts from an extremely sophisticated point. It does not start simple, stupid, and become super smart. And the last thing I want to show here is how this thing looks in terms of, um, yeah, I, I cannot show it for some reason. Uh, th th those those uh, tubules, just for your information, they are not just stretched there all the time. They form together something called the cytoskeleton, which gives the, the, the cell its shape. But also, when some material wants to be moved from one place of the cell to another place, those microtubules self-assemble, that was the fourth one, and they just stretch like magically in front of the, of, the, of the protein motor so that the protein motor can walk carrying the proteins or whatever it's moving around from this point A to point B, and then the microtubule dissolves. Imagine this, you want to go from, from New York to Brooklyn and then a bridge just, you know, happens to uh, appear in front of your car and then a car appears that you ride and then when, when you're there, you know, the whole bridge dissolves. This is like science fiction. And now if somebody tells me this is random events taking place, please tell me which random event has taken place first. Is it the random event that has created hundreds upon hundreds upon thousands of genetic uh, uh, um, uh, material to create the proteins first, the kinesins or the dynins? Or is it the random events that created the microtubules, the actin fibers or whatever other materials? There are thousands of these motors in our bodies. And when they were traced back, they were found to be ubiquitous. Life depends on them. How does these things, how do these things happen? I'm going to go very fast, 10 seconds each. If random mutation is correct, and in the beginning I said I'm fine with many things, I'm not fine with random mutation, life is not based on randomness. We're 150 years away from Darwin, we are like 60 years away from neo-Darwinism, and we expect, these are hypotheses, we expect that if randomness is driving this, then number one, the major transitions of life should be explainable by random mutations and natural selection. They are not. If you start at the edge of abiogenesis, which is having a protocell, the transition from a protocell, which should be simple, stupid, to the least universal common ancestor, LUCA, is not known. The transition from prokaryotes, which is, oh, maybe LUCA was like a prokaryote, but prokaryotes are very sophisticated. Bacteria is very sophisticated. Yet, the transition from prokaryotes to eukaryotes is not explainable by random mutation and natural selection. Absurd uh, uh, theories like uh, endosymbiosis have to be involved. The transition from eukaryotes, which, has, which are unicellular in nature, to multicellular organisms is not explained by random mutations and natural selection and other absurd theories like colonial theories have to be uh, invoked. So number one, this no explanation for every single major transition in the history of life is not explainable by random mutation. You can put on top of that, how did sexual reproduction come into place? How did this, how did, you know, mar marsupials happen? How did placental things happen? Nothing is, 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 is explained. The major things are not explained. Number two, we expect to have a smooth gradient we don't have a smooth grade in the history of life because if you are invoking small random mutations very very small changes then we should have very smooth gradient for life we don't have we have things like the Cambrian explosion we we were all told billions of years three and a half billion years 4.5 billion years but all life as we know it today every single big animal that we know today or marine creature occurred only 540 million years ago, and through a period of somewhere from 7 to 15 million years, everything that we know today has happened. Does this make sense if the main driver is random mutation? Absolutely not. We expect also, 
innumerable transitions of life forms. We don't have any transitions of life forms. Yes, we have many fossils, but I have asked questions to evolutionary biologists, to people who are very entrenched in this. I just ask a very simple question. Start from a cow, a modern cow, start from a modern horse, and trace back the exact ancestral lineage of that horse or cow or rabbit or fox or any other terrestrial mammal and tell me uh, which are the specific don't tell me the class and it was this kind and this kind and that kind of uh, a family tell me this is the animal this is the predecessor animal this is the specific predecessor and show me the fossil there is nothing Okay, I'm, I'm gonna need to start wrapping. Uh, I, I need a conclusion coming up. Uh, by the way, man, you, you, I've give, given you wait yeah. ten more minutes of time, time. So, what's your summation, real quick? Give you one more minute to yeah. wrap it up. So, <clears throat> one minute timed. All right. So, yeah, um, I don't need to go more. Like, so we have the genetic mechanisms. Um, we have genetic uh, uh, um, uh, 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 code that is against uh, mutation. <laughs> um, we have. Um, uh, uh mutations um uh, that are muted when they happen we have an abundance of example we we expect abundant examples of beneficial mutations but we only see deleterious ones so how come mutations are are the driving force um we expect that plenty of junk dna and code project showed that we are like 60 to 80 percent in bacteria and simple organisms junk dna is almost nil just two or three percent uh, Non-coding DNA turns out to be coding for things beneficially all the time. Um, we expect things to be not efficient, but we are learning efficiency from nature. We expect that there are no jumps, but when we look at the human condition, we find language that is unmatched by anything else. We find intellect and we find free will. All of these things are great jumps in the history of life. And if mutations are what is driving this, then I can say comfortably, then nothing makes sense. All, All right. what mutation gives is um, a state of laziness where when we know uh, something, uh, we don't know something, then we say it's random. This is not the proper position of human intellect. We should get out of this randomness claim and look into what's really happening if we want science to advance. All right, Thank that's you. a good summation there. All right, so so you guys, okay, so I'm, I'm going to have you guys back and forth now. Let's be clear here. I've listened very carefully to both of you guys' presentations. You guys came from a very, very different perspective. Dapper's talking about natural selection. You're talking more about intelligent design. I see the disconnect already, but I, I want to see you guys have a back and forth on this. Um, I don't care whether you start from Dapper's side, dealing with the peppered moth, um, Coccolicus fours, talking about natural selection, or if a Dapper wants to dive right into your things, with the um, you know kinesian molecules and, and transportations and, and 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 how you know meiosis meiosis and all this stuff, hey, take your pick where you want us to jump in, Dapper, because he had plenty of time. You can either go okay. really from where you're starting to because I, I I there is a huge disconnect between you guys' presentations. But um, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. I have a free form black and forth, maybe for about twenty minutes, to thirty minutes to see how it goes, and then we'll take uh, some questions. I do have one question from the audience, real quick. I'm not gonna have you guys answer it right now, but I'm put it on the table for later. So you don't forget if you don't mind. And uh, Danish debater had asked for 50 DKK in the, for the Q and A. So you guys don't forget. You can pair for it now. From each, if you had to select one of each outside of religious works, thank you. Can you mention one book and one paper to support your views? But we'll get back to that and your answer to that during the Q and A. But I don't want to forget about it. So in the back of your mind, have some paper or book that you want to recommend. But um, Dapper, it's all yours. All right. Uh, so there were a whole bunch of things brought up. Unfortunately, I think most of them fall into what I call the G-Wiz category, which is basically, look, this thing in some organism or lots of organisms is really complex, therefore, but that's not an argument. If you want to say that something is complex, therefore, mutation and selection and drift and the other mechanisms of uh, evolution cannot produce it, you have to actually produce reasons for that. So all of the things about showing really complicated um, biomet uh, biochemistry, not in itself an, an argument. And I was actually kind of surprised uh, that Ahmad, that you brought up um, genetic algorithms, because the thing is, while it is true that the selection criteria were set up by humans, it is in fact random changes to computer code that are in fact themselves producing complicated engineered uh, plans, at least not actually physical objects, but then, you know, humans go and make the physical objects and they do work. 
And so what we have in life is simply, rather than having an artificially produced selection criteria, we have the same thing, except it is simply did whatever the organism is successfully managed to keep reproducing and reproduce better than its um, conspecifics, say. And so <clears throat> just the fact that we can use genetic algorithms is itself very high confidence demonstration that random mutations with non-random selection can in fact produce very complicated things that in some cases humans can't understand. There have been instances of humans using genetic algorithms to create machines that they don't entirely understand why it works. We've actually seen this with uh, genetic algorithms producing airplanes that are aerodynamically stable, but that no human designer would think would be. They just end up being so. Uh, so, uh, Dapper, yeah, do, do you want me to jump in here and, and we, we, we close point by point or, or how, how, how would you like to go through uh, with this? Um, yeah, if you want, I'm I'm open to you uh, responding to the, the those few things that I just said there. Because I'm taking notes, but I I think they will accumulate. So if you'd like, we can just close them one by one. So you can bring up something okay. I respond to it. Sure, go ahead. You want. So uh, you mentioned two things. So um, the first thing is that uh, I say these things are too complex, and they cannot occur by random mutation. Now. Um, uh, yes. Now we need we need to look at a, a very specific point here. Now, what is the default logical thing? Is the default logical thing that a complex system is a design system, or a complex system is the result of randomness? So I would claim uh, why I'm showing this is that I would claim that normal human reasoning is that complex things are products of um, a design of a mind. And if you, if you, if you, if you, if we find that life has started at very, very simple starting point, and then we can see very, very small additions uh, uh, to that, we might think of it. But the issue is these things that I have shown and other things that are even much more complicated have been there since the beginning. Actually, we don't know what was there before them. So. As far as we can observe, life has started from a very complicated point. So if somebody is claiming it started with a gradual thing, there is no gradual thing. So this is why I'm bringing that. The second thing is that, yes, I did bring out genetic algorithms, and it would be peculiar for somebody who is arguing against randomness to bring a genetic algorithm. But I'm a person who likes to confront things. And in my field, in, in computer science and in communications engineering, Communications problems are very sophisticated. We cannot solve them. We need to use the genetic algorithms. And what genetic algorithms essentially do is that they change features of a circuit or an antenna or whatever, um, aerodynamics of a plane, so that we can find a solution. But how do they work? You give the genetic algorithms exactly what you want to do. It will not generate a plane for you with new aerodynamics without knowing what you want to do. It will not generate a new antenna in my field without knowing what you want to do. You have to give it what is to give it what is the gain that you have to give it the beam uh, uh, width that you want. You have to give it this and that, and you have to tell it uh, these are the components that you can change. And to make it reach a solution, you give it ranges for these changes, and you put an algorithm for selecting the the, the, the outcome. Otherwise, it will never converge. So if somebody says, we have this thing that is generating errors, mutations are errors, they are copying errors during reproduction, or they are defects caused by radiation or whatever, we have errors. They are errors, they are not trials, they are errors. Genetic algorithms use trials. Mutations are errors. And natural selection is blind. There is no objective function. It doesn't know what you want to design. So those things are nothing like genetic algorithm. So this is my re uh, reply to, to you. Why I brought it is because I want to confront this to the end. I have gone into numerous discussions with people who are even trying to emulate genetics and biology using, using computer models. And when we look at the facts, guys, these are not random things. You're putting an objective function and you are moving towards it. And with okay. this complexity that we're seeing, uh, this is nothing like random mutations. Uh, genetic, uh, the genetic algorithms are nothing like that. All right. So yeah. there are uh, a couple problems there. One, like I said, there is in fact a fitness function that is objective in the world, which is simply uh, comparative reproductive success, as well as simply not dying out. 
and we know that there are objective things that are done for this. At the very basic level, uh, life forms are just organisms that maintain a thermodynamic heat equilibrium while using energy gradients, whether they be chemical, thermal, uh, you know, photons or whatever, in order to power their processes that keep them at thermodynamic disequilibrium with the environment. So when that ceases, that is a selection against, and when they fail to reproduce uh, at a higher rate than their competitors, there's also a weaker form of selection against. So we know, we have observed instances of random mutations with selection criteria, both in nature, in the case of many observed instances of uh, evolution of novel features of speciation in both the lab and in the wild. And we also have examples of random mutations with selection in the case of genetic algorithms. The fact that a human has set up different survival criteria than nature doesn't change the fact that given a selection criterion, which we have in nature and random mutations in both cases, there is no reason to think that we cannot get complicated and to some extent hard to understand systems because we observe it happening today. And in fact, one of the things that you pointed out is we were going back a little bit to bio, abiogenesis. I don't particularly care to go back to abiogenesis because if you wanted to have that topic, it would be a different debate. But um, you did also mention uh, that <clears throat> how we go from prokaryotes to eukaryotes is uh, apparently some mysterious thing. But the thing is, we have observed endosymbiosis taking place, which is essentially the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, is eukaryotes are a lineage which has taken in other organisms as um, symbionts, the things that live with them inside the cell. And we can see this now. For instance, um, there are, there's a kind of, uh, well, I, I'm going to call it a protist for ease, even though I know that the word protist is no longer really scientifically accurate, but people know what I mean, called a uh, pollinella. <clears throat> now, most species of pollinella are uh, predators of uh, cyanobacteria. They go and engulf them, you know, take them apart chemically, take all those nutrients and produce waste. But a subsection of them actually have started taking cyanobacteria and then use them directly as a new form of chloroplast. And in some of these species, we're actually seeing some of the genes for photosynthesis transferring from the bacterium member of this new organism, what is now the new chloroplast and being transmitted into the nuclear DNA of the pollinella. And we also have observed instances of organisms going from single cellular to colonies to actual true multicellularity. For instance, we've seen it in various lab lines of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is brewer's yeast. It's how you get, you know, beer, basically. And so given certain selection pressures, such as um, filter feeding cellular predators or uh, some other experiments have involved centrifuges that separate out, you know, larger organisms from smaller ones. Other ones have done um, settling experiments. The things that settle to the bottom of the, the tests, test tube or flask or whatever are, are taken out. And <clears throat> in these cases, we've seen uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a single celled uh, organism, go to clumps of cells. And then from there, start to actually have divisions of actual function in the cell, which is the definition of multicellularity. A multicellular organism is a collection of cells where not all the cells do the same thing. And so the very basic version of that is you have somatic cells and reproductive cells. So the somatic cells are involved in all the metabol uh, metabolism, doing uh, pre producing the structure of the organism and whatnot. And then the reproductive cells are just there to create new descendants of that organism. Real quick, Dapper, I want to make sure we get up in here a little bit. Um, so there's a little yeah, more sorry. back and forth. I was forth. starting to ramble. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. This is what I do. Uh, okay, so let me let me respond to a few things of what you've said, which is you've raised really good points, but I think each of these points might might as well be be, be a debate on its own. So let's 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 first look at the matter of natural selection will 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 pick things uh, uh, based on survival, and and then you you mentioned endosymbiosis, and then you mentioned. Uh, transition to multicellularity, which are things that I mentioned in my presentation. So I will take this reverse order. order. So let's look at multicellularity. So uh, you, you mentioned the filter feeding thing, and I think you're, you're referring to the experiment, maybe the one about the paramecium that is uh, acting as a predator uh, uh, versus algae. And, and, and let's look at what, what happened into, uh, in this experiment, essentially. Algae is, is, is a kind of, of creature, a unicellular creature, that uh, has many modes of existence. Uh, they exist 
in, in, in single cells and existing colonies. And there are many algae and many unicellular organisms that will go in colonies when the conditions uh, call for it to cooperate. And there is no multicellularity in this, in this experiment. What happens in the experiment is that the algae that were living uh, alone under threat, they, they colonized and they, they keep, they maintained the colonization even when they reproduce. And in some of those experiments, um, uh, even when the predator was removed, the, the, the colony mood of existence remained for many generations. However, colonies are not multicellular organisms, colonies are colonies. And there is no um, uh, cell differentiation, there is no um, uh, specialization uh, that occurred. But there was in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I, 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 I have actually a um, uh, 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 long video on that or a few videos on that and um, maybe I would need to refer to that specific experiment but people would like uh, typically to invoke things like Volvox and um, and they say that look at this algae that is a transition state between unicellularity and multicellularity it's a colony that acts as if it's an organism and it does not and all what's happening is that the algae that are on the rim are using their flagella to move while the algae that are inside use their flagella to to split the cells apart and if uh, 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 um, <clears throat> one of the algae on the rim wants to act as uh, 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 one that reproduces it just uh, moves its cilia inside and 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 it just does the thing and if you separate one of them from the inside or the outside it will just do the whole thing they will just survive and they will form new colonies so, uh, so uh, you're I think not... we, we need a clarification yeah. what yeah. is it that at a minimum would make a group of cells multicellular as opposed to a colony because i do agree that there is a difference but i want i want to know what it is for you that makes it cross that threshold that's a very you good are question. A collection of cells that, that, that's that's that that's an extremely good question and this question has a philosophical aspect and the philosophical aspect is what is life uh, so if you look at so here's my hand and my hand has many cells in it yep. but the identity of the creature is me i am the organism and those cells are part of me the one that wants to survive is myself so the cells in my hand they receive an instruction to, 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 to die and they die. And when they do not die, they become a disease. They're called cancer. So, so program okay, so cell death. can get cancer? Yeah. I'm sorry? So it, it, I really want a, 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 as concise a definition as you can. Is your definition yeah. multicellular so organisms the, can have cancer and colonies can't no. have cancer? No. no? So okay, the what, is the, what is the difference? So the definition, the borderline, in my opinion, is whether the identity of the organism is held at the multicellular level or at the individual cell level. So does the individual cell strive for surviving or not? Or is it that the whole uh, set of cells strive to survive? This is number one. And number two, that for them to be an organism, so um, some of the cells will manifest the DNA in a completely different morphology some will look like a kidney cell and some will look like a skin cell and some will look like a neuron and those cells do not look at all like each other because they have completely different functions they will go into that morphology and they will stay into that morphology okay so can i summarize it, that yeah we'll, we'll make them stay let, like this. let me try to summarize and, so we have yeah. cell differentiation and apoptosis if if a group of cell cells differentiation, cell differentiation and identity well, Who, I don't know what identity means. Identity is at which level does the organism um, um, strive to survive? Is the well, organism strive to survive at the multicellular level as this is one unit or is each individual uh, cell uh, wants to survive? And so, I can give you a little example if you would like. Um, but, but well, maybe we're, gonna, you, we're, you we're, we're, at, we're at the hour mark and I, and I think we've kind of 
diverged from the actual topic a little bit. Okay. I want to kind of try to bring it back a little bit, but uh, not, not to shut you guys down on this for a little. So a little bit. Of, uh, I'm gonna. I have some own questions as well. I got two super chats. I'm gonna get them out of the way. Um, I want. I want to wrap this up real quick about your dialogue when it comes to multicellularity and um, like a. a, a some kind of colonial, colonial type group. I mean, for example, like the Portuguese man of war. Would you consider that to be a multicellular animal or colonial type animal? And what do you mean by identity? Because I was kind of lost on that too. What you meant by identity? Because uh, even for a group, when they have an envi- a species that wants to somehow survive, so even as a, a, a multicellular animal as opposed to a colonial group, the goal is survival. And the whole topic is is. That's a survival based on natural selection. Is there going to be a descent with modification from selective pressures that this animal or whatever unit um, is going to survive through mutations? I think that's the the intent of the topic. So, real quick, wrap it up. What you what you mean again by the difference between multicellularity and uh, uh, some kind of colonial group? And then I'm going to read the two super chats and then kind of hopefully get it back on on, on track. Okay, sound good? Yeah, that works for me. All right. So you want to wrap it up real quick, Ahmed? Yeah. So I. For me, yeah, the transition between a colony and a uh, single or multicellular organism is two things. One, colonies can incorporate relatively unrelated organisms. Um, so not all the cells have a single uh, genetic ancestry. Uh, multicellular organisms, they do all have a single ancestry, whether it be simply from, you know, an embryo that developed asexually from parent or whether it be, you know, an embryo that is the combination of two other organisms. And also that there be... Um, cell differentiation, which is morphological. So if you can divide into uh, somatic and reproductive cells and the whole group of cells has a single common genetic heritage from a single original um, cell or group of identical cells, then we can call it a multicellular organism. We have seen the development of such organisms multiple times in different uh, disparate taxa, in both in, uh, in the lab, and I'm not sure if we have any observed instances in the wild, but we do know that it can in fact happen. And we know that it happens through, through mutations because we sample the genetics and we sequence them and we can keep track of which genetic changes happen. And it turns out that actually, the, there aren't actually that many genetic changes that you need to go through to go from single celled free living to a colony and then on to having differentiation and having uh, gametes that go on to produce new groups of cells that are themselves a multicellular organism. Okay. That is my wrap. Sounds good. All right. So Macabre for ten dollars straight at, uh, said, "This is not a question." He says, "Ancient con man mooches off old women, rapes children, and commits wars of crimes. It inspires modern engineer to argue that science and, and bad. I feel bad for humanity." Stupid whore energy for five dollars says, "What does Ahmed think about examples of endosymbiosis like Carcinella Rudy, uh, a sequenced genome that is on the path of the symbiont and organelle?" If you're familiar with that work. Okay. Can. Let me first answer your question here about the um, the multicellularity. Do a small yes. wrap up. Go ahead. So, sure. uh, to my knowledge, there is no experiment where you have started from a single cellular organism and you ended up with a multicellular organism, which means that it has uh, cells that has the same D- the same DNA that has gone into perpetual specialization, and then it can reproduce and uh, form a, a new uh, a creature. And then one I, of the reasons. I for them they're they are numerous and they are trivially easy to find so that you haven't you aren't aware of them to me says that you haven't looked for them and that might be because no one has brought them to your attention but now that someone has i'm hoping that you will look into them because it is a well-known type of experiment that can be repeated many times and each time you do in fact result in multicellularity often through different pathways which means we have multiple ways to get there so yes, it's, so it's, I have actually, it's like telling I have you actually, no one has ever bred cows. It's just not the case. And that you've never heard yeah. of it doesn't really change that. So I have actually heard of it, and I have actually looked into specifically the papers that claim that, the one about the yeast, the one about the, it's called the de novo origins of multicellular life observed in the lab. And I have read all those papers. I have them. I have my remarks on <laughs> them. And when you, look, when you look, when you read the exact paper, uh, you will find that this is just a multicellular colony. There is no organism there. But we, we can have that on a separate one. But the one that I want to point out here is that one of the reasons that life is so difficult to move from single cellular to multicellular organism is that when, when you create a colony, there are, there are those uh, uh, guys who are called cheaters. And what a cheater is, is a, a, a unicellular organism that contributes to the colony, but it takes more than it gives. 
And uh, guess what? Um, uh, the more the colony lives, the more cheaters happen. And the more cheaters happen, natural selection favors the cheaters because they are taking more and they are more efficient on energy. And the other cells know nothing about what's happening. And eventually what happens is that those cheaters cause the colonies to break down. And this problem is an unsolved problem. And it happens over and over again. So it's actually look, not. All right. All right, all right so let, let's, well, let's get back to the, yeah. uh, the thing here. So, so yeah. Supernova Energy has that question on the table. What do you think about the examples of endosymbiosis like Carcinella okay. Rudy and the sequence genome between the path and symbiote of organelle? Because you had mentioned something earlier that for some reason you had denied endosymbiosis, endosymbiosis even though um, the mainstream, and I'm sure Dapper would agree, the mainstream approach is that there has been some form of endosymbiosis through the mitochondrial, you know, um, uh, the matrix, right? Uh, that's why we have extra ATP production for animals. And then plants have had some, something similar happen to them. But you've denied that. But what do you think about the the, the examples that Carson Rudy has had for the sequence genome that he did? Okay, so uh, let, 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 let me take the, the mitochondria as an example because this is a, a very important... And, and even the cyanobacteria, which is claimed to be the, 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 the precursor of... Um, uh, you know the photosynthesis uh, in um, in plants, but let's let's look at the mitochondria. So you have the mitochondria, which looks like uh, another unicellular organism, another prokaryote called Rickettsia, and it is claimed that uh, um, it is uh, essentially mitochondria is a Rickettsia-like endosymbiont, and it at one point of time it went into another uh, uh, cell, and here we go. And you look at the Rickettsia, you find that it has a few thousand uh, genes. You look at a mitochondria, you find it has 37 genes. And there is a rule in, in evolutionary biology that homoplasy is not evidence for homology unless you establish ancestry independently. So if mitochondria, in some of its features, like for example, it has ring-shaped DNA, looks like Rickettsia, which is a prokaryote that has ring-shaped DNA, this is not evidence on its own. And we go back to what is life. When I have um, a bacteria in my gut, and we have plenty of bacteria in my guts, in our guts, are those bacteria still independent organisms or are they part of me? The consensus is they are independent organisms. They want to survive regardless I survive or not. If they are into, symbio in, 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 into uh, symbiosis with me, they are good. If they are not, they are diseased. But when you look at the, the, the mitochondria, the mitochondria only has 37 genes. Uh, some of them are uh, code for RNA, and just 13 of them, if I remember correctly, code for proteins. And those proteins are the exact proteins that are needed for the enzyme complexes that are involved into the energy production thing. So the mitochondria is essentially a, a, a powerhouse for the cell. Right. It has nothing else. But, but the question so is, uh, hey, I, want to, I want to bring back to the question a bit because I think you're, you're, you're... Yeah, so the answer to the question is, if we are claiming that this is endosymbiosis, then we are redefining symbiosis that one of the symbionts is sacrificing its life. This is not what endosymbiosis or any symbio symbiotic relation is. Symbiotic relation is both live and both are making benefit. So I really find that this is a misnomer, that invoking symbiosis to explain eukaryotes is one of those, you know, gym, mental gymnastics that evolutionary theory pulls off uh, every now and then when the uh, normal order of things, which is a smooth gradient, fails to be fulfilled by random mutation and natural selection. It happens all over the, the evolutionary path in all of those uh, uh, four points that I have mentioned. One of them is the formation of eukaryotes. Whether now we are going back to cyanobacteria, which is uh, forms the chloroplasts, claim to form the chloroplasts, or to uh, a rickettsia, which is claimed to be a rickettsia-like thing that formed the mitochondria, or any other thing. You will go into the organelle, you will not find a full DNA uh, a sequence, or a very, very small thing that is very specific to its function. It is not a living creature. And why would a creature go there and sacrifice his life? And if there are things that we see into other endosymbionts and any other symbiosis relation, uh, uh, um, Show me the path. At what point of time did the endosymbiont decide to give out, give give up its life? And I, uh, but, but, but real quick, her, 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 hang on one second. Her question is though, um, on the C. ruddy, which is the, the, the supposedly one of the, the smallest genomes out there of, of a symbiotic relationship. Okay, she's asking though, how did it go from a symbiont 
to the organelle itself because if it, it, it was engulfed, right, and uh, being an obligated endosymbiotic relationship, at some point there were two individual things. They came together, right, and all now it became more from a symbiotic relationship to an organelle, right, and the same thing with, would be with the mitochondrial DNA. That is separate DNA, right? Um, it is an organelle in the body. Uh, she's asking, how did that come about if it wasn't through like natural selection? Through um, because the whole th topic of discussion here is how do these things come about through descent through modification, if not through natural selection? Now, Dapper, you are arguing that it's from selective pressures. You're arguing that that, um, that there's no there's no real uh, teleological a aspect to it. That's not to, to somehow a function. Because I re remember you came in here uh, originally, Ahmed, when you talked about function, right? Um, so I think Sarah's question, Superhero Energy's question, is really on point here to the whole discussion itself. Of why do we have things like endosymbiosis? You could you could deny the 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 uh, mechanism, but why is it that we have those things that work um, through some kind of seemingly natural processes for the overall benefit to form something like an organelle for the for the, the animal? Yeah. So the first step in endosymbiosis is, of course, you know, uh, the larger organism engulfing the smaller one and then failing to actually kill it, which can happen for a whole host of reasons. Um, I don't think we really need to get into every single one of them since we can watch it happen. And so at this point, now you have an organism which is going to become an organelle. Now, if it is going to survive, it will have to reproduce with the host. And any host um, symbiont relationship in which the symbiont is providing benefits to the host is more likely to have uh, the host evolve to support it and vice versa. Now. You can say, why would it get rid of some of its genes or why it, in fact, it generally doesn't get rid of a lot of genes. What actually ends up happening a lot of the time is the genes will transfer to the host organism's genome. And then certain genes that might be shared between them, the copy on one one will may end up being, um, you know, deleted through a deletion mutation or something like that. But that um, the gene is still going to exist because it's, if it's necessary, it will persist in either the host or the symbiont. And so really, all you need to know it for why would the symbiont choose? It doesn't choose. It's now in a situation where there, the options around are mutations that will make it more likely to reproduce with the host, which will be selected for, and mutations which make it less likely to reproduce with the host, which will make it selected against. There really isn't any big mystery about this. It's everything is exactly as we would expect. And the reason that... Um, endosymbionts tend to have small genome sizes is exa exactly like I said. They tend to only carry a few genes that are actually vital to both the symbiont and the host. And those are the only genes that have any strong preservation on them. So, you know, things like deletions or mutations that break uh, genes that are not necessary for the symbiont don't get selected against. And that really is it. In fact, we, like I was saying with Polynella, we can actually see instances where the cyanobacterial genome is being in some cases transplanted into the host Polynella uh, uh, nuclear genome. And so some of what in the original cyanobacteria would have been its own genes for producing various proteins involved in its photosynthetic functions are now actually being produced by the nuclear genome. And they're actually transplanted from them. We can tell which area of the original cyanobacteria lost this gene and where it was inserted into the Polynella genome. And this is a thing that's currently happening. We are watching a new kind of blue-green algae evolve before our eyes via endosymbiosis with known still extant groups in both cases, both the symbiont and the host, that are free living. And we also have instances where they are in fact in a organelle and host situation. So we're just watching it happen right now. We don't even have to worry about whether or not it could happen in the past because it is currently happening. It's like someone telling you that trains can't work while riding a train. So the, the question there is, uh, Dapper, at one point, does the uh, endosymbiont decide that it's better for it to die? Because we're not looking at one or two genes here that have moved. We're looking at more than 95% of its genome lost. And when you lose 95 of, your, of your genome, you have died. You have you have. You know, you know, your 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 hand is not a separate organism. Well, my hand your has hand the same gene as the rest of me. Yeah, exactly. So, so now this organism that has a different identity, that has a different, it has a different life of its own. Why 
from its own perspective of natural selection, would it, natural selection is all about survival, yes? It will, it will undergo changes if this helps uh, its survival. Mm -hmm. So number one, where is the survival if you lose 98% and you become, you become somebody's generator? This is not survival. This is, this is, you have died, you have become a part of something else. And well, then, okay. and then, are they still around? Yeah. That's you see where I'm coming from? No, I don't. And then, what you're saying makes zero what, sense to me. And then, what what changes? What is the process where you would change from ring ring shaped DNA into the normal double helix DNA that the eukaryote has? Where is where is this process? And where did the nucleus of the eukaryote come from anyway? Because they well, the, both cells were supposed to be prokaryotes, and prokaryotes do not have cell mem uh, nuclear uh, membranes. And where did these perforations on the nucleus come from? And how did the nucleus of the eukaryote let okay, in? We're, we're, shifting yeah, yeah, we're not yeah. shifting goalposts. The yeah, question sorry. right now, the question right now that you proposed before you started shifting the goalpost yeah. was yeah. how is it beneficial to lose large amounts of your genome as a um, as an organelle? Then you started asking new goalpost shifting questions. So we're not we're I'm going to ignore the goalpost shifting because that's a dishonest tactic. And it might not be intentional, but it is what happened. Now, to answer your original question about losing your genetic in information or losing large sections of your genome, like I had said, those parts of the genome in an endosymbiont, which are no longer required, no longer have positive selection in order to, for them to be preserved. Therefore, they tend not to be. It's the same reason that when you see um, cave fish who have been living in caves for long generations, because the genes regulating things like um, eye structure and eye development are no longer positively selected for, they tend to be lost. And the reason that you can say that they have, that it's selected for is simply because, I mean, look at any extant multicellular eukaryote. They're full of billions to trillions of mitochondria. Mitochondria have not gone extinct. They're doing quite well. In fact, very few eukaryotes have ever lost them. I There is one possible group of um, single cell eukaryotes that I think it's not clear if they lost them or if they're actually basal to when um, eukaryotes first got mitochondria, but we know of an animal with no mitochondria. It's in fact a mixozoan, which is a kind of um, uh, cnidarian and they are parasitic cnidarians. And one species of these doesn't even have mitochondria, but overall eukaryotes maintain multiple mitochondria per cell. So mitochondria are doing just fine in terms of survival. And that's all that's needed. Natural selection doesn't really care about your personal assessment of whether it's better to be a free living bacteria with a large genome or whether your personal assessment is that it's better to be a tiny organelle with a small genome. As far as natural selection is concerned, your human biases towards one of those things doesn't matter. The fact is, after being engulfed by a larger cell and not being digested, it is beneficial for both, for both organisms to produce mutations which allow the eventual creation of the current situation where we have the mitochondria with a tiny genome essentially playing powerhouse for larger eukaryotic cells. So genome size doesn't matter? No, yeah. it, it only matters if the genes in question are actually important to survival, but once they no longer are, they're no there's longer no, required. It, it, selection ceases to operate on them and they will go away over time. So as long as the mitochondrial DNA is producing the extra ATP, because normally we'd only get ATP from like, uh, you know, some kind of glycolysis process or something, right? So mm -hmm. um, because animals use a lot of energy, right? Because we have that extra ATP production now allowed for multicellularity, allowed for more complex structures. And I think Ahmed would probably argue that that isn't something that could be described normally but from some kind of just random stochastic natural process, if I understand his argument correctly. Well, there's selection, yeah. which is not random. Uh, let me comment here about the moving the goalposts, uh, uh, because there, there is no moving of the goalposts. What I'm saying here is, this is what, what is claimed, that you have a, a creature that has like 5,000 genes, and it goes down to 37. Okay. So for it to go down to 37, the claimed thing is that the, the, the 4,900 and something moved from its own genome and went into the genome of the host eukaryote, right or not? So not now, in all cases. Some of them did. Some yeah. of them almost certainly did. But some of them probably simply were lost over time through deletions because there was no selection pressure for them to stay. So, so let's look at the status quo. The status quo is what, build, what, what makes the mitochondria itself 
is not that the, the, the 12 or 13 genes that produce the, 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 the proteins that are needed for the enzymes for the energy production. The body of the mitochondria is manufactured through proteins that are expressed from the nuclear DNA in the eukaryote host. So what I am saying is, for this process to be claimed that it is a result of an endosymbiotic reaction, then we need to understand, if there is no mechanism, then it didn't happen. Because this is science. If you cannot prove it, it didn't happen. It's, it's not a, a hypothesis, right or not? So we have a, a creature that has 5,000 genes. It becomes 37. And miraculously, the, the, those 5,000 genes were building the whole creature. Now, the, the, the other genes that build the rest of the creature, the rest of the proteins and whatever, the lipids and whatever else this creature needs, are expressed from the nucleus. So how did this migration happen? For this migration to happen, ring DNA has to be converted into double helix. It needs to go through the, the nucleus, which is a very protected the nucleus, has a cell and a nuclear wall that is very protective, that had pores, that will only allow things in that should come in. You cannot just inject DNA into the, the nucleus of a cell if it doesn't want it. So th there is no path. The issue is that there is no path. Yes, you can claim that there is endosymbiosis because mitochondria looks like rickettsia, rickettsia or because uh, um, chloroplasts look like cyanobacteria. But they can also claim that it's the same designer who is designing everything. So now, the you... thing is, if you claim this is an endosymbiotic reaction, then show me the path. How will 4,000 and something genes move into the nucleus? This is now the question. Now, this question is not solved. We can claim that it happened. But unless we can solve it, it remains a hypothesis. And so I'm sorry, the thing is, the horizontal gene transfer doesn't happen? Horizontal gene transfer between what? Between ring DNA and double helix DNA? Yeah. You are looking at a eukaryote. You are not looking at two bacteria who are exchanging genes of the same type. All right, uh, Ahmed, we, we know of current historical instances of eukaryotes transferring known genes from known bacteria that they have engulfed into their actual nuclear genome. This isn't an unobserved thing. We know of it happening currently right now. You, you are so, in a world uh, where this is currently happening. This process that you were saying can't happen is currently happening. Like I said, your entire argument about endosymbiosis has been like someone who is currently riding a train and claiming that trains are impossible for various reasons, mostly incredulity. Your incredulity does not negate the fact that it is currently, right now, in 2021, a thing that is happening. Why okay, is it so... that you would pers persist in saying, this thing that, that is happening right now can't happen? Because I believe that we are not witnessing it happening. If you have a paper that shows that it is happening right now, that ring so... DNA from a creature that is an endosymbion to another one, is being transferred to the other one to the extent that it's losing 98% of its genome and becoming an organelle. Okay, let's look at the research. And if it's happening, oh, okay. it's happening. Let's say we go back to we're 10% into this losing of the 98% of the genome. Would you tell me yeah. after presenting you with a paper like that? Well, because it's only, you know, it's only lost 14% of its genome. This doesn't count. Would, would you say that to me? Because I suspect that you would. Well, now, again, again, if, 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 if you gave a good example here. So you have a fish or a creature that's living in the dark and it would like, and it, it doesn't care really much about I, vision. I so like it, that. I have an answer, though, Ahmed, yeah. real quick. Could, could yeah, you answer so, that question? Yeah, so if, if a creature loses a part of its DNA that it doesn't need, it's okay. But Steve, could if I get it that loses, if, it, if it loses everything except for the need of another creature, it is not okay. This is what I'm saying. Okay, I would like you to answer the question that I asked, though. Yeah, All right, let's, yeah. what's, what's, formulate the question specifically, Dapper. So the question is, if I show you a paper about a currently ongoing process of endosymbiosis, but the genome of the endosymbiont has not been reduced to the point of 98% yet, but it is in the process of that, will you come back to me and say, well, it hasn't lost enough of the genome, therefore this doesn't count? Because I, I, I suspect look, you might. I would, I would look into, I would look into the paper for for this, this part of its genome that it's lost. What functions does it correspond to? If those functions are essential for its being, for its composition, and it has lost it happily to the host, then I would accept it.
Okay, but what if it's only done 10% of that? It, it's not a matter of the percentage, definitely. Okay, okay good. It's, good. If it's it is losing, something, something was without, it, okay, so, so real it, quick. It's the, matter, it, it's the matter if it's losing part of its genome that will make it um, okay. unlivable, unsurvivable outside of the host. Well, okay. later on, okay. either today or, or in the next few days, I will send you some papers on endosymbiosis in Pollinella. And um, I look forward to your uh, response to that. All right. So let me ask, let me ask you guys this. Um, so go on, let's look, take, for example, uh, the cavefish, right? Uh, everyone knows the story of the cavefish. You know, they, they live in darkness. They don't need their eyes. So any genes relating to eye function, um, it could be lost through whatever deletions or whatever. It doesn't matter because um, it's not energy efficient to the fish. They, the fish rather use that energy for something else. So it doesn't really care about the eyes. We all think everybody on that page. So uh, the question really is, and going back to the, 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 the title of the, the discussion, um, what makes that happen, right? I mean, if natural selection is simply, and I, and I honestly think a peppered moth just could have been really done, honestly. I think that kind of was the, the, the example, the definitive example of natural selection. But, I agree. But if... If through somehow the selective pressures, it is, hey, look, this fish no longer needs these genes, whether, whether the genes are deleted, whether they're just non-functional, where it's junk DNA, makes no difference. The fact remains that those genes are not going to be around because they're just wasted energy. And that is to the benefit of the fish, the organism itself, through, for survival through natural selection. Now, Ahmed, you say, you know, since you're taking the other approach, if it's not through natural selection, what is causing those genes to no longer be important to that fish because of these the conditions that the fish is in, such that it doesn't need a size. That, that re, to me, really is the crux of this particular discussion. Would you guys both agree on something like that? Yeah, yeah I, okay. I, I think that's fair. All right, so go ahead, Ahmed. I, I have no problem that natural selection exists. So if, 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 there is a, if this is a specific uh, uh, creature that's living in the dark, there is genetic entropy taking place all the time, and there are deleterious mutations taking care of the time all the time, taking uh, taking place all the time. So the ones that see, and the ones that do not see, due to they become disabled due to a mutation, will have the same chance to to reproduce. And since you know, seeing is not an essential function to life when you are in the dark. Can you tell you us know, what you but, mean but, by by genetic yeah. entropy? Because I, I I know the term right. I know the term from from uh, Stanford's uh, was it uh, what was the name Stanford Stanford. Um, I think it's Stanford. Yeah, um, but that is not in any literature I've ever seen, as far as um, science. So, what do you when you say like genetic entropy? What do you mean by that? So if, if, if so, let's say this. So, so the, the genetic material of any creature is degrading with time because it is accumulating mutations. We can agree on this, right? That's not true. No, I one hundred percent disagree. That there have been numerous experiments attempting to observe this kind of thing, which is actually in science called error catastrophe. An error catastrophe is nearly impossible to induce. Um, in fact, I know someone who tried for quite a while to induce error catastrophe in a population of bacteriophages. And while he did eventually get the populations to extinct, even then he still couldn't actually show that it was error catastrophe. And quite frequently, despite saturating all of these bacteriophages with as many mutations as mathematically could possibly happen, they would persist and entirely recover in the course of him going home for the night and then coming back in the morning to check on his uh, cultures. So no, genetic entropy is a completely nonsense idea. It does not happen. There is nothing to it. It is bunk. So back again to what I am saying. So if you are accumulating errors, the errors that will make you not care about it, so you get an error that causes your eyes to be blind and you are living in the dark, so you will have the same chance to reproduce. But if you get an error that will make you also deaf, then this error will be selected against, and you will just, the other ones that are not deaf are going to survive. So I'm essentially saying the same that you are saying, that there is the, the aspect of survival that will balance out this continuous mutations that are happening. So if we agree on both those things, number one, we agree that mutations are deleterious in nature. So where do, do the innovations come from? Well, we don't agree. Well, well, I think this. I, hang on, hang on. Let's stop there for a second, because I think because you just kind of threw that out there. We all, everybody agrees. Hang, hang on, I mean, um, So let's talk about what you just said. Because just be fair, because um, you threw that out there, okay. and I think there's obviously going to be pushback on there. Because um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, most most uh, mutations are going to be in more in the neutral category. There are yes. deleterious ones, but the beneficial ones are the ones that are going to be selected for over a, a period of time 
That's the whole point of, of complexity. That's the whole point of descent with modification, which is the topic. So even if there's going to be del deleterious load of some kind, there's going to be some kind of deleterious errors that are going to be cropping in. Those are expected to be, I guess, weeded out, phased out, because the, the organism is less likely to survive, meaning that the ones with the more beneficial mutation, rather than the deleterious ones, are going to be selected for if there's not a neutral muta mutation, right? So if it's some mutation that has a phenotypical characteristic that can be acted upon, it is more likely... The, the species or the animal or the unit itself is, that has the beneficial mutation is more likely to reproduct, be, be reproduce. And that's the whole thing behind it is reproductive success, right? And so I did throw that out there about the, the deleterious things. I don't think Dapper would agree with that, right, Dapper? I no, mean, just... I would not agree that mutations are on the whole deleterious. Yeah, now, yeah. I would say that there, most mutations, because you got to remember, most mutations end up in no phenotypic change because either they're in non-coding regions yeah, mm -hmm or they result in synonymous co uh, codons, or even they can change a protein, but the change is not actually going to affect um, how that protein functions. Because you gotta remember, most proteins are actually fairly robust and can undergo a significant amount of change without actually um, having any measure. You can have an amino acid um, substitution and still have a function right. of, uh, okay. Um, so then after we get rid of, after we set aside neutral mutation, it is the case that in any given um, fitness landscape, most, actual random changes to phenotype, which are going to result from mutation, will take you away from a fitness peak. But because you are in fact on a fitness landscape, some of the random directions in which the phenotype can move are in fact to higher fitness peaks. And the only way that this could not be the case is if you're already literally on the fitness peak, in which case any phenotypic variation will end up being selected against. But generally speaking, because fitness landscapes shift, organisms are almost never managed to get literally to a fitness peak in their local fitness landscape and therefore there are almost always available beneficial uh new phenotypes which means that there must be by definition available uh, beneficial mutations and because any mutation that in principle can happen is likely to happen at some point in many populations for instance humans are mutation saturated there are so many humans that every mutation that could occur in a human genome is likely already to have occurred somewhere to someone um Therefore, there will always be beneficial mutations that can be selected for. So when you have, so when you have, so when you have such a high amount of, of um, uh, iterations, right? So many people have in their genes. You're, you're arguing that it's, more, it's likely that pe certain people are going to have the same exact mutation. Yeah, actually, we we know. So <clears throat> I guess I can't say for certain, but if you work out the math as to how many mutations could possibly happen and how many humans there have been uh, over you know the past few thousand years. It is almost certainly the case that every possible mutation that could happen to the human genome has already occurred. Mm -hmm. And since we know that some of them have to be beneficial, we know that there have been beneficial uh, mutations in humans. And we actually know a few in particular, for instance, uh, lactase persistence, which is actually an increase in the strength of the promotion of the lactase enzyme production. So what happens in lactase production is normally in most mammals, you have a promoter for lactase and it ends up getting swamped by other signals. And so lactase is not produced at a sufficient quantity to continue to digest lactose. But in many humans who have uh, lactase persistence, which I suspect actually uh, Ahmed is in that group because he lives in, a, I believe he lives in a region where that's common, where people can eat dairy. Um, the promoter region is actually strengthened. It promotes lactase more. And so later and later into life, you continue to make enough. Although in some cases, you don't make quite enough, which is where you get to mild forms of lactose intolerance. So you get people who can like eat a little bit of cheese here and there, but if they sit down to have a bowl of ice cream, that's going to cause problems. But the, okay, so but the, the, well, that's a good example. The lactase persistence kind of that mutation like, actually has occurred more than once in the population. I believe one time it happened, and then ten thousand years later, or something like that, it, they occurred again and it was selected for, if I'm not mistaken, on the lactase persistence. But um, that may be untrue. So 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 let's take a let's I'll pick an example like the, the let's go with lactase persistence, uh, Ahmed. Um, since the topic is the same with modification through mutation and natural selection is true, um, and you, you you obviously would agree that lactase persistence would be a good thing, right? Normally, the, the as you said, the promoter causes it to shut off at a certain age, I don't know, like two years or something. So we're no longer able to produce the enzyme to break down lactose at a certain age. Um, and that's why the persistence is it's so good. It gives us an alternative nutrient source, right? That has been selected for through natural selection. But you're saying that is false, right? That's the whole thing from the, the topic of the discussion. It's false. If it's not true that it's being selected for from natural selection, what are you positing that's causing that particular beneficial mutation? Because you have a whole new ca uh, carbon source here, a whole new thing to get um, uh, energy from, which is beneficial. What are you causing that is causing that selection? What are you positing as causing that selection? 
Okay, so actually, Dapper and yourself have, have have raised here four good points. So let's let's take them in sequence. So number one, the the people who argue for genetic entropy do not say that uh, you know catastrophes happen. They argue that uh, mutations that are typically more or less neutral or very very slightly deleterious take place, and since their effect is very slight, they do not get selected against. But their accumulation will eventually cause an issue to the whole population after some time. So this is their claim. Uh, now, whether this is, is, is what is happening or not uh, needs to be tested. However, we see that um, if we acknowledge that DNA is not predominantly junk, which uh, occurs to, uh, uh, to be discovered more and more every day, that what we, we're thinking is junk is not junk, then uh, changes in functional DNA will typically uh, 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 cause damage. What, what, and what, so what do you use have, the term junk for? If what, do you, what do you mean by junk? That's, 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 that's an open question. Not everyone yeah, has it, the same definition. Exactly. Yeah, I, I've noticed that as well. So when you're using the word junk, do you mean non-functional, non-coding, no conformational changes? What, when you say the word junk DNA, what specifically do you mean by that? So um, what I see is that one of the predictions or one of the... Um, Part of the world view of the mutation uh, 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 paradigm is that uh, genome gets extended by continuous transpositions and duplications here and there. What do you mean and by junk? And that, yeah, and that those duplicates uh, have no function. Okay, yeah, right. we, get, we understand. But what do we? We have ninety-eight percent. There is a perception that the human genome has ninety-eight percent. Uh, doing nothing. But what do you mean? Uh, okay, people... but this is what we're trying to. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but that's what we're trying to to to, to ask you. When you say non-function, do you mean non-protein coding, or there's no conformational shape? There's no detectable activity because when they did the um, the the the, uh, the product on that, right? Um, they basically redefined a lot of these things, and they said, hey, look, if we detect anything, anything, even even a spurious transcript or a conformational change, we're going to call that somehow a non. Uh, we're going to call that somehow somehow to function to it. The term junk DNA, typically, if I'm not mistaken, referred to non-protein encoding genes. Yes, which is not to say that it doesn't do anything. It could have it could have mRNA. It can have it can have other things that it does, but it just doesn't produce a protein. Well, is that how you're if, using if, junk if, DNA, or if it if it produces RNA, if it regulates something, whatever, then it shouldn't be called junk. However, the initial perception was that only a very small part of the human uh, genome did something, and the rest was chunk. And then with time, we understand that both introns and extrons have mm -hmm. function, and that, uh, you know, there was this ENCODE project. Yeah, the ENCODE project, yeah, exactly. At one, at one, one phase problem. of the project, yeah, they had a very low yeah, bar right. on what would consider to be functional, right? So, so if it did have any regulatory some, functions, it would consider to be a functional right. thing, right? There, there are some problems with their, their definition. One is that uh, anything like spurious transcription, where a bit of DNA ends up as, R, as being transcribed into RNA, and then that RNA just does nothing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they would call that function. Also, they called methylation targets function, even though methylation at a particular site in the uh, genome actually tends to restrict the ability of that site in the genome to actually function. So far from, you know, methylation targets in what I would say is being evidence of activity, it's evidence of inactivity. In fact, yeah, um, I agree. viruses are often methylation targets to prevent them from producing diseases. So the ENCODE project's definition, even by the admission now of some of the members of it, is broad to the point Very that lax. it is... Useless. Using their numbers to tell you how much of the genome is actually important for the phenotype of an organism, in this case humans, is um, not very useful. Yeah, and that's so why I like the difference between ju junk and, and garbage DNA dapper. So, oh. for instance, if, if something is functional because it's a methylation target mm -hmm. and then it mutates, there's not likely to be any phenotypic change because the fact that it was a methylation target in the genome means it likely wasn't being expressed anyway. Well, uh, Ahmed, had, had, when he said earlier, I don't, I, I think he said, because he was talking that he accepted things like, you know, uh, I think he said Evo Devo, but he accepted epigenetic as well, right? I mean, uh, Ahmed, you, you, I think that you mentioned that, right? So you accept, you accept that methylation things happen to, to, to exist. There's epigenetic factors um, that could, sure. could be selected for. They're probably not a long-term thing, but they can actually be going from one generation to another, but probably not for very long persistence. But those things you do accept, right? Of course, but okay. uh, let, let me continue complete my argument here because, okay, so sure. we're, looking at, we're looking at existing function for the lactose, 
we're looking at uh, um, uh, um, part of the genome that um, we, we, we see stopping this function for some humans and not stopping it for other humans. And it happens that those humans happen to be uh, uh, guys who take care of cattle in Africa and some parts of Europe. And both of those populations uh, develop lactose persistence after um, at a specific point in history where they uh, uh, became breeders. Now, this takes me back to an experiment that uh, Dapper here has, has mentioned, which is the Lensky experiment. Uh, which is a very indicative experiment because what Lensky did is that he put those bacteria and he deprived them so uh, they only have citrate around them. and the initial impression was that uh, um, a mutation has taken place but if, if you really look at what has happened you will find that the bacteria the E. coli in this case had all the machinery to metabolize citrate and that the only component that changed was the transport part to enable the citrate to infiltrate the cell in a proper way. And that what happened is that the cell took a reaction where uh, um, a specific part of its genome was copied to the active part which used to transport glucose, and now this part can transport citrate too. So I'm, 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 I'm very skeptical when somebody calls this a mutation, because it's not. It is a part of the genome that has been moved under a specific stress condition, and it didn't happen randomly because it even happened in two groups out of five, if I remember correctly. And since this experiment claims that it is a repeatable experiment, it means that anybody who would do it other than Linsky should get the same result. So it means, and even I think he used the term acceptation for that. So I would, I would claim that many things that we as humans, with our very limited knowledge, start by calling something junk and then uh, take notice that it's not junk, start by calling something a mutation and then notice that it is an acceptation or that it is an adaptive response or it is an epigenetic response. We only know about epigenetics two decades ago or three decades ago. So um, I think that invoking randomness as the solution for everything that we do not understand that we find that a single uh, uh, a nucleotide, a single base pair has changed. In a part that we used to call an uncoding region, it causes the, the, the lactose intolerance to stop. And it causes that very conveniently in the uh, uh, populations that are breeding. And uh, how did this spread? Some say that this uh, happened because, you know, a kind of famine happened and then people who could drink milk survived and then we have to we have to make up all those stories because we have to fall back to a random event while the more we learn we find that epigenetics is doing things that the cell have these amazing mechanisms we've just discovered crispr we we know that 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 our genetics are so sophisticated we know that we have error correcting mechanisms and gene editing mechanisms that are totally unimaginable if we go back a few decades ago, just 10 or 15 years ago, we, we knew nothing about these things. So if you look at the reality of the progress of our understanding to what happens in our cells, everything, in, in, in my opinion, the more we see that it is not randomness that is driving this thing, the more we see that this program this information repository, this DNA, uh, this, the genome, and what is on top of it, the epigenetics thing. And who knows where epigenetics come from? Where, where does, this, does this information come from anyway? And, and, and what are the limits? What are the limits of epigenetics? Can epigenetics be, for example, five or six or 10 years from now, be discovered that it can re-edit the genome itself? Not only it does the methylation, and not only does the histone wrapping, maybe it can do something else. So why? It, and it's, it's the genome. It's not epigenetic. It's genetic. It's, yeah, That's it, the, the, definition. the epigenetic is beyond the, the genome, right? So if, it's in, if it has an effect on the genome, it can't be epigenetic. It could well, be an environmental well, cause for mutation, but that is not epigenetic. Can, That's what, do, you, do you think there's a, a, real quick, do you think there's a funnel? Oh, go ahead, finish up. What if there are other mechanisms like CRISPR that are editing genes upon need? What if this thing that happened in the Lensky experiment where a part of in, in my in my word in my point of view, th this has been an intentional rewriting. This is not a random transposition that happened in the Nesky experiment. You think it it's intentional? You think that's an intentional thing? 
There's a it functionality. Is, okay, okay. So, so let me let me clarify so for the audience here. Let's hang on, hang on. Let's see of bacteria that is uh, uh, starving, and there is only citrate, and suddenly citrate transport is activated. How on earth can we think that this is a random? Well, let's, 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 not. Let's, let's look, look at this real quick. We, we are, we, let me, let me, we let are running back in time. I'm, I'm going to put you on the hot seat real quick, Dapper, okay? Because he's okay. been on the hot seat a little bit, and I think it's fair that you are. But let's, for the audience, recognize that um, natural selection doesn't claim to be a stochastic process. Natural selection isn't random. You can have variation that's random, and then you can have acting upon that. But natural selection itself, nobody, I think, claims that that is uh, a random process. But Dapper, so he makes a good point. Um, okay. I mean, I already I, I knew the answer to it, but I want to, do, uh, to put you on the Seat. So he's talking about Lenski's experiment. Now, the metabolic pathway uh, pathway already existed in the E. coli. It just wasn't for an anaerobic uh, condition for the citrate metabolism, right? Yep. Because so, so um, the bacteria in two of the flask, I believe it was, I think you mentioned, which is right. Uh, this 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 um, occurred. This uh, the, out of twenty thousand whatever um, cycles uh, of iterations of, of, of generations, uh, it, this mutation occurred uh, more than once. And he is saying. That if we do the exact same experiment, shouldn't we expect that at some some one of the flask we should have this exact same mutation? Is that what you're t- asking, Ahmed? It it already occurred in two flasks. Yes, not yes, one. Uh, yes, yes, two flasks. I agree, I agree. So so we should be able to repeat that experiment and have that happen at some point, correct? Yes. Okay. It's, yes. It is. Yes, it is possible for it to happen again. But there are a couple of things to to point out. One is the two populations in which it had happened actually shared an ancestor population in which a priming mutation had occurred. And without this priming mutation, the subsequent mutation would not actually allow us to trade metabolism. Uh, all right, but what was, so, what, was there, what, 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 what happened if we had the original population to do the experiment if with? We ran, if we ran, re-ran the experiment and, and we had a population size that was big enough to saturate uh, mutations such that every mutation that can occur is almost certainly occurring, mm-hmm. then because both the priming mutation and the subsequent mutation that actually allowed for citrate transport into the cell are both possible mutations, we would expect that it is indeed possible for both of those things to happen again. Mm -hmm. The question is, why is that not random? If I take the entire set of all random possibilities, and it includes these two possibilities, and then those two possibilities happen in a small subset of my population, that is entirely consistent with random mutations causing this uh, citrate transport to become an option for these E. coli. And the fact that it didn't happen in all of them, I would say, argues strongly against the idea that it's an intentional thing. If it were intentional, if the bacteria in some way or some higher power were intending for the bacteria to now be able to metabolize citrate, it should have been a much more widespread thing. So it's actually arguing for evolution in both directions. The fact that it can happen at all with mutations that we know happen randomly and that are consistent with this large number of mutations that are happening across all of these trillions of bacterial cells, that it happens at all means that evolution can indeed proceed via mutation and non-random selection. And it also means that, in fact, because it's not universal, there is unlikely to be any intentionality behind it. And he makes a good point there, Ahmed. We addressed that. um, So let me me make sure we have the question on the table to be uh, specific here. If it occurred twice in all these trillion things, where's the intentionality come from? Okay. Where, where is the intentionality? It, it occurs, number one, it, it occurs tw- twice out of five, if I remember correctly. So well, there I, think there was ten. I, I think there's ten vials of asking, if I remember correctly, but we're, but, I, but so, irrelevant. Well, where the suspicion of intentionality is, is that you are not looking at a mutation that does the whole thing. Number one, it was not a mutation. The, the, the citrate transport uh, 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 gene was there already in, geno- in the genome. It just moved from um, an inactive promoter to the active promoter. So how- That's how, mutation. How can That's you... mutation though, would it not be? Yeah, yeah transposition this, is a mutation. This is like a transposition, but it's not like a, a base pair has changed. And number two, that only the transport was enabled. So 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 the citrate can come in, but the whole rest of the metabolic cycle of citrate was already programmed. So once citrate was in, it was being metabolized. Okay, so-, so... you. So, so it is there, and it is the machinery is there to metabolize citrate like it's there to All metabolize. Right. Let me see if I understand the argument. So, <clears throat> I think your argument right now is that this, perhaps these mutations, because they are mutations, transposition, duplications, these are mutations, are 
that's fine and dandy, but because it didn't produce any particularly novel function, it simply reactivated a function that we suspect was pr ancestrally present in E. coli, but that no longer is, it's not enough. It doesn't do enough. Is that a reasonable um, assessment of your uh, argument? By, by the way, I don't mind if we call the mutation. My issue is if they're random or not. So we can call anything a mutation. I don't mind. Transposition, deletion, addition, insertion. I don't mind. Call it whatever you want. It is not random. This is the issue. Randomness what, is not the way to show. This what makes it issue. not random? How do we know that it's not random? Because we know the transpositions occur randomly. We know duplications occur randomly. And that's what happened in this experiment. We assert that they occur randomly. Maybe this is an argument from incredulity, you know. Because well, we when, don't have when, you, when, when, when you have bacteria, and bacteria tend to be very efficient, having all the machinery for citrate, only the transport is, is, is missing. And then it gets turned on in the right place. Invoking randomness here looks absurd. You have to no. agree with me on that. No, you I will don't. Not have, you will not have a power station working on diesel, and it has all the equipment for working on natural gas for no reason. And then when diesel is out, uh, somebody opens a valve and natural gas is coming in, and we call this a random event. This is exactly what happened. Okay, well, here's a few things. One, uh, factories are not at, factories being run by intelligent humans are not a very good analogy for. Uh, a bacterium. <laughs> I mean, there there are ways in which there are similarities, but just the fact that the humans running around the factory know what they're doing makes this a, a bit of a disanalogy here. But the other thing is, if it were a large group of the bacteria that had this uh, mutation happen, then I would agree that would be somewhat suspicious that this large group of bacteria all had the exact same mutation. But that's not what happened. Even in the flasks, which develop citrate um, metabolism, what would happen there is not that the entire flask would have this overnight. One or two bacteria in the flask would start out this way, but because of the fact that after a short amount of time, essentially all the glucose was gone and all that was left was citrate, they would then come to predominate the population in the flask, which is in fact what was actually observed. Because in the experiment, after the glucose supply was running low, the flasks which started out cloudy because of the bacterial explosion in population after only a few hours would then clear out again because most of the bacteria had died. But in these citrate uh, metabolizing flasks, the cloudiness persisted for a very long time because in fact they were eating the substrate which was not previously um, digestible. So you don't actually need a large number of bacteria to have these mutations. In fact, if it happens in two flasks, we need a maximum of three bacteria total. One to have the priming mutation and one in each flask to have the final mutation that actually allows citrate transport. There is no reason to think that this isn't random simply because we have billions of bacteria undergoing mutations and we can check other bacteria and see that they are having similar but not useful mutations. You, in order to say this couldn't be random, you have to show why and your incredulity is insufficient. The why is that all the billions of the bacteria have all the machinery to complete the metabolic cycle. So to okay. say that complete a cycle with an already existing part of the genome is a random event is is, so a, is what, if, an, what if we had an organism that gained an entirely new protein that it didn't have before and that gave it a new function would would that be of note to you okay so 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 let me be very clear here the 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 the, the matter of mute the the phenomena of mutation is something that happens okay right it is very rare that this thing would generate something of benefit, but it might happen. Now, the question is that when this thing that comes, um, that, that is of benefit, this new protein that you talk about, and then this new protein it comes about, if it's of benefit, it means that the system around it is ready to receive it. There is a function waiting for it to happen. Now, this makes it way, 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 way more difficult, okay? Things that are way, way, way more difficult can still happen. But can this thing that is extremely now difficult to happen explain the origin of species? This is the question. So I will give you a final example. So sometimes something like sickle cell disease becomes beneficial. Okay, It is a disease. It is a deformity in hemoglobin. It causes red blood cells to become sickle. It causes people to have plenty of problems and plenty of pain and a horrible life, but it also causes the malaria parasite not to be able to uh, uh, get into the red blood cell. Mm -hmm. So under a malaria situation, this is beneficial for people so as not to die of malaria. 
Yeah. But the issue here, the issue here is when, because I'm referring here when you were talking about being at the peak of 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 uh, efficiency or at optimum fitness or not. Um, mutations. We always see mutations breaking things. Even bacteria resistance is no, is is. We saw them very frequently. Mutations are breaking things, causing oh, deformity, etc. It's, they it's can't be always. To say always. Uh, actually, I am. I have looked and looked. Um, okay. Well, let me let me help yeah. you. Here. So, yeah, do you know what uh, Antarctic ice fish are? Um, I'm 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 I just want to complete this sentence. Um, um, I think you are going to 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 invoke the matter of antifreeze proteins, etc. I might. But now, yeah. So so now, what I'm saying here is that. The vast majority, even population genetics asserts this. The vast, the vast majority of mutations will be deleterious. No, some neutral. will be, uh, some will be, neutral. some will be neutral if you acknowledge the matter of having a good part of the DNA uh, doing nothing, and then a change to a coding sequence oh, will no, then do nothing. We we don't have to acknowledge that. We know for a fact that most of the mutations that occur in populations have no measurable effect on phenotype because we can measure the mutations. And we can check to see if there is an effect on phenotype. We know one for as as much as much confidence as science can ever give anything that the majority of mutations that occur do not affect the phenotype of the resulting organism. Okay, we got that we got to start we got to start wrapping it up here, guys. We do have only about five minutes. Okay. What I'm going to do is this. Um, we have Q and A left. Or? Uh, uh, what's that? Are we still doing a, a Q and A or no? A couple um, of minutes of. Yeah, no, I'll give you plenty of time. I got a super chat. I got to get to. Okay, so let me get that okay. out of the way. Uh, eight point five dollars. Uh, uh, I would, I would, as a question in the super chat. But Dino Dan, Dapper Dino is giving the question, so no question in the super chat. I'll make a comment that even uh, Creation.com recognizes what's called the Delta uh, CCR five Delta thirty two as a beneficial mutation. So not all of them are deleterious. Um, go, go ahead. Um, if you want to take any more Q and A, I know you're going to have an after show on your channel, Dapper. The link is in the video description, um, and people will find it over there. Do you guys want to take a few questions? I don't mind going maybe maybe 10 or 15 more minutes. I wanted to kind of have a hard thing at two hours, but we can go over if, if you guys are up to you guys. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a few questions if, they, if people have any. Okay, so um, Ahmed, did you want to do that? Go ahead and go ahead, by the way, finish anything you want to finish up. I want to make sure you have plenty of time, um, and yeah. then we'll go from there. So, so uh, just, just to wrap up and make sure that because we've gone through plenty of discussion, what I'm saying here is this. Um, we have uh, a theory that claims to um, explain the origin of life. It means um, it is putting itself in a position to explain how life has evolved from uh, a, least universal, a last universal common ancestor until the human being. And what we see on the ground is that in, 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 in all or the majority of the major forks on the road from Luca to human being, other mechanisms other than mutation are invoked. We do not see in operation that mutations can produce these kinds of effects. We see in operation that mutations um, can be sometimes apparently beneficial, but in the core of what they are doing, they are essentially deleterious, like the case of sickle cell. Some mutations might be beneficial, but they, they are point mutations. Maybe we later, find out that the, the antifreeze protein was not really a mutation, it is something else. But even if it is, even if it is few nucleotides that changes from this kind of protein to that kind of protein, the question now is, does it make sense that, um, is it even mathematically possible that a random process, a process that is based on errors in reproduction, would line up so, so, so many mutations all in a row so that you start from Luca over uh, uh, um, or actually since the Cambrian explosion or a little behind it, you start from unicellular organisms and then within a few million years you have all this kind of diversity that eventually leads to the human being after uh, a while. Um, I think that this is um, a stretch. I think that human knowledge as we stand today is so behind. The more we know, the more we know that we do not know. To the extent that continuing to invoke randomness as the driver of life, as the innovator of life, and natural selection as the filter that directs uh, uh, this to the to the right place, is so much of an offshoot. This theory needs serious revision, 
Um, the, the, the longer we continue looking at randomness as the source of life, the longer we are missing opportunities to find real mechanisms and to file to find the real progress and to give real benefit to the human race. This is my position. Um, I am I am not denying anything. I'm just denying that um, disorder is what generates uh, progress. All right, I got I got about three uh, questions here. Um, uh, for uh, one, one of them is is pretty straightforward. Do you agree natural selection is not not uh, random? Natural selection is not random as far as the biology of the organism itself is defending itself. Natural selection on its own is not a thing, but it is not random as far as the status quo. But when we are looking at progress, then you are looking at moving from point A to point B. Natural selection has no point of view whatsoever to where you are going. So it cannot take you there. It it's, not goal, it's not goal driven. I'm sorry? You're, you're saying it's not goal-driven. It's not goal-driven. Okay. There is no objective function in right. natural selection. Uh, it's not wants... like a genetic algorithm where you are trying, making trial and error for a certain goal. Okay. It might as well take you down the road like it does. It, it favors cheaters in a colony. It, 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 it will favor people getting uh, sickle cell disease if malaria is prevalent. But what happens when malaria goes away, these people will suffer. All right. And yeah, this I'm... is not the kind okay. of mechanism that will create the human being. Uh, Eating point wants to know for two pounds. Uh, whatever that is. Do you accept uh, is guided evolution your position? Guided evolution, and that kind of goes into one of my questions no. I have as well. But do you think yeah. it's guided? So guided? Guided evolution has a theological aspect. So I, I will just say very few comments here. Now, some people would go say guided evolution, and when they use the word evolution, they are invoking the mechanisms that are coming behind evolution. And the primary mechanism in macroevolution is randomness. So what they are essentially saying is that God will be guiding because nobody else is guiding, unless even aliens or something. So if the person who is guiding this, who is God, is using randomness, what I am saying here, that if you are coming to this from a theolog theological standpoint, you are essentially asserting that God is intentionally obscuring himself. So that when you do your research, you will find that the hard core of the, of the process of progress of life is randomness. And the definition of randomness is that any future event has no relation with the present or the past events. This is what randomness is. So you cannot penetrate this shell of randomness. It means that God is completely obscuring himself when it comes to biological progression of life. This is not consistent with any religion that I know about. It's definitely not consistent with my religion. In my religion, in Islam, God gives a specific instruction to Muslims to walk the earth and look at the origin of creation. There is actually a verse specifically asserting this. And if this verse is there saying specifically this, it means that when we look at how creation has occurred de novo and how it has progressed, we will find signs of intervention, of intelligent creation. We will not find randomness. So the people who are believing in guided evolution I think they need to, they will have to either redefine randomness or redefine guidance. Guided evolution does not, is not compliant with the theory of evolution, which invokes randomness. This I, is my I, position. Think, I, think, not I, I think you might have, a, I, I think we might be a disagreement on what is meant by random because uh, a lot of people would probably think random, and, I, and I'm one of these people, random is stochastic. Um, we, random means it could be a deterministic thing. But we are unable to be aware of all the information. For example, let me ask you this because it's similar to what um, you were talking about before. But let's say that, that I, I flip a coin. Once that coin leaves my hand, it's a deterministic process. It's guided by the laws of physics, okay? But I'm unaware of what the outcome is going to be. I don't know. I have no information about the system where there's going to be heads or tail. It is a perfectly random system, stochastically to be, because I don't know the outcome. But it is deterministic, right? So I think it's fair to ask, how would we recognize a mutation that has some intentionality behind it by which it was somehow made to be a, the case because of, a, of, a, of some, I would say, a mind, because in order to have intentionality, you have to have some kind of mind to do it, as opposed to just flipping a coin and whatever the result is based upon the laws of physics, but we are unaware of it. How would we recognize the difference between an intentional whatever uh, making that coin heads or making that coin's tail 
as opposed to a stochastic random process, which is just missing information about the, the system, the, the outcome of it, and then apply that to like the Lensky experiment. How would we know that that is intentional rather than just a stochastic process where we're just not able to have the, the information to determine it, even though it is a deterministic process? Your point is clear. It's very clear. But this is exactly my point. It is because what we call random uh, are essentially processes that are, by their physical nature, completely unpredictable. So why would God tell us, look at the origin of creation and you will find me, if those processes are random or random to the extent that we cannot know how they happen, how can that be evidence for God? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying here is that as far as we're concerned, those processes are, are, are random in the definition of randomness that can be modeled by a Markov chain, for example. And, and this means that no matter how you want to find intent behind it, you cannot. This is the whole issue. It is random because you cannot find intent behind it because there is no causal relation between past, present, and future in a random process. Um, so this is the whole point. So people who, 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 for example, in my religion, people who invoke something called occasionalism. And, and what they are saying is that, yes, it looks random to us, but essentially God is, 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 is managing it from behind the curtain. Well, well, if this is the case, he wouldn't point you to it. He wouldn't tell you, go there and look for me and you will find me because he knows that he has created it in a way that you will only find randomness. So I, I do not believe in something called guided evolution. I believe that if God wants to guide uh, the process of uh, evolution of uh, bio um, uh, uh, biological evolution, he will cause the right events to happen in the right time, like what happened in the Lenski experiment. He doesn't need to cause a trillion gazillion creatures to die due to uh, mutational diseases to, 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 to obscure himself. God is not in this universe to obscure himself. He is in this universe to be found. This is my theological position. And, and guided evolution is a theological standpoint. It's nothing, it's nothing more than that. All right. Um, all right. So we're going like to wrap this up a little bit. Um, the question was asked earlier about a paper. Um, if you guys had to each suggest one paper, what would you suggest? And there's no way in hell I'm going to get into photos argument right now, um, Icarus. Uh, we've all been there, done that. I actually, I actually think photos <laughs> argument has a has, is really interesting. Actually, I, I I think that people poo poo it away too quickly, and they shouldn't because photos argument is is very good uh, about natural selection. But that's a whole different video there, buddy. Uh, but uh, I, I think you would agree on that, Ahmed. Obviously. Um, so if you had to recommend a paper, Ahmed, what would you recommend? Then I'm asked after the same question. Give you guys about five minutes each to kind of do a recap, and then uh, you. Guys can help over to Dapper because I mean, there's th this is a never ending topic. There's so much to talk about. You guys have put so much on the table, and um, I, I, first of all, I want to say I applaud both your guys' ability to communicate on this topic very, very eloquently. Um, I miss these types of conversations. They were amazing that we used to have the non sequitur show, and you two both typify what we would have on, on the non sequitur show to have these kind of discussions. So I want to thank both of you guys for that. But go You're ahead. Uh, go ahead and tell us uh, what paper you would recommend to people, Ahmed, then Dapper could do as well. Well, I actually would recommend the exact papers that uh, that we were talking about. I would recommend people to read the De Novo Origins of Multicellularity paper, to, lead, to read the, the paper where Lenski did his work on E. coli, and find out for themselves if there were any trans real transition from single uh, cellularity to multicellular organisms. If there are really a random event that has driven E. coli to, to, to metabolize citrate. And I think uh, um, uh, people reading about, uh, we don't need to read to, to notice that, for example, human language, human intellect, and human free will are nothing like any other animal. So where, where is the gradient that is predicted by the theory? And putting those three together, one that looks at the complexity of the eukaryote, one that looks at... Uh, 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 um, which was, uh, you, you can look at uh, uh, videos like what we have seen, people who have modeled the molecular machines. Uh, those are really amazing. And then the papers, the couple of papers that I have talked about, and then the very observation that there is no gradient whatsoever between humans and anything other than humans. Nobody talks like us. Nobody makes this eloquent conversation like us uh, uh, that Dapper did. I will not say that mine is necessarily eloquent. Nobody thinks like this. Nobody has this scrutiny and criticism. Nobody goes out of his way and rebels and says today uh, 
uh, it's this kind of world tomorrow it's capitalism the day after it's the other uh, thing and the other one no, we make our own rules we have free will where is this in the rest of the animal kingdom or the rest of the creatures living around us we are not the product of a, 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 a continuum of a smooth gradient of mutations there are very big jumps in 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 evolutionary biology i i will not call it evolutionary biology uh, there is a, a, a design i would say that looking at embryology where a single cell a sperm uh, and and an egg will merge together into a single cell and it will unfold to make a human this is how creation is no no randomness there the, the matter that it unfolds over 3 billion years or 500 million years or 9 months is not is not material the thing is there is a designer that made this thing who is able to make it unfold intentionally through design through programming that can unfold over nine months and can unfold also over a few billion years this is my position and this will be very obvious if anyone looks at the material of the evolutionary biologists themselves armed with some with some mathematics and some logic putting prejudice aside I, I think um, I think I think it is not difficult. It's the same evidence that everybody's looking at. It's a matter. It's an epistemic matter. It's a matter of back the world view. It's a matter of epistemology. What interpretation you reach. And just uh, commenting on what you said, I would like to thank uh, Dapper. I think uh, this is a respectable person to have a conversation with. Uh, uh, this conversation is what I hoped it to be. And uh, I'm glad that you moderated this, Steve. Uh, it was really fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. And likewise, uh, we're going to take that as your kind of your summation, I guess. I think that was well allocated. So, uh, Dapper, I'm going to give you uh, the same amount of time uh, to kind of wrap it up. And you can take it over to your channel uh, and continue on. Because, like I said, there's a million different things you guys could talk about. And uh, I only got two, yeah. two hours plus, not seven. I do. I am going to be on Drunken Peasants <laughs> tonight to throw my own thing out there. People want to watch at 6 o'clock. I'll be on with Ben tonight. Uh, that's going to be fun. Don't know what the topic is. I never do. And they never tell me, which is scary. I don't like going into to things ill-prepared. because, But, you know, it's still kind of fun. But uh, Dapper, go ahead and, and wrap it up for you. All right. So uh, in terms of what I would recommend for reading, uh, in terms of papers, I don't have a specific one, but I would encourage people to check out some of the uh, papers about the topics that we discussed. So for instance, uh, read papers coming out of the long-term Lenski E. coli experiment, uh, read papers on the uh, novel endosymbiosis in Polynella, uh, read papers on the emergence of de novo uh, multicellularity in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, brewer's yeast. Um, so check some of those out because all of those will give you the actual hard numbers. But if you want a more lay level read that will show you the deep, deep connection between humans and non-human animals, uh, I, I highly recommend Neil Shubin's inner, uh, Your Inner Fish. Uh, I recommend it to everyone. Uh, it will go a long way towards describing exactly how it is that um, various developmental genes result in wildly differing anatomies that are yet still based on the same um, genetic basis and the same basic structures. You can watch experiments where they gave uh, stingrays fingers. You can watch experiments where they uh, do, you can read about, you know, things like um, giving alligator embryos feathers by just subtle tweaking of various developmental genes. It's fascinating. And I think uh, if you read that carefully and take it on board, you probably not see uh, developmental biology or evolution quite the same way anymore. Um, and I, I, I'm going to throw that in there. I happen to think You're in a Fish by Neil Shubin is one of the best books I read on um, yeah. phylog uh, phyl phylogeny and these types of concepts. Brilliant book. Um, well yeah. written, well explained. Is, it doesn't matter you're, you're a creationist, evolutionist. It doesn't matter. It explains things very well that anybody can understand. And, and it is one of my favorite books as well. Uh, as far as the summary, um, yeah. basically, I, I think... We primarily heard uh, almost entirely in incredulity from uh, my uh, debate partner here. Um, we Many of the things that he said we don't have examples of, we not only have examples of, we have examples of them both in the wild happening now, as well as in laboratories. Um, I have yet to hear a good reason as to why we can say that mutations that are beneficial aren't random anymore, or why it is that random mutations cannot actually produce uh, complex structures or produce beneficial mutations 
uh, there was an assertion of intentionality that I don't think was sufficiently well backed up and that was in fact contradicted by the actual preponderance of the evidence. So basically, um, I don't think that my opening statement has really been assailed. We know that dissent happens. We know what happens with modification that is caused by mutation. And we know natural selection filters out some of these uh, modifications and that the ones that aren't filtered out are the basis upon which further, dis further dissent with modification occurs. I think that this has been a, a fairly solid and easy, well, not necessarily easy, but a fairly solid win for the um, affirmative position on the resolution. Well, let's see what the uh, audience has to say in the comments section. Um, I'll keep you guys both posted. Both of you are in the Great Debate community on Facebook. Uh, and I'm sure the conversation will go over there. And Ahmed, I would love to have you back to talk about some of the epistemological concepts that you had brought up, because that's that's kind of more my jam than the biology, although I love biology. I have, you know, I'm obviously familiar with this to, a, to, a, to an intro level degree, because I've had so many of these discussions. The, 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 the guy I go to when I need to find out something. But I, I do like epistemology, uh, epistemology a lot. So I, I'm happy to have you back for that. If you guys want to join the Great Debate Community on Facebook uh, group, by all means, pop in there. Uh, we have great discussions. It's, it is, unfortunately, a relic from the Great Debate Community on G+. But, hey, mo a lot of my audience has been around for seven, eight years, and they, they, they're well aware uh, of all that. So with that, guys, I want to thank you both very much for coming in. Again, I am very impressed with both of your guys' knowledge levels, your elocution, your argumentation, and the fact that uh, this didn't have to turn into a dumpster fire, and it sure didn't, and it was productive, and you guys were great. Let the audience decide, of course, you know, who they think has a little bit better argument. That's how it works. But I love the fact that we can all get together. We can have these discussions. And people know by now I moderate the way I do non sequitur show when I have these types of discussions. It's not just, you know, letting two people speak. It is an interaction between the host, the mods, and the people listening. It is a, it is a symbiotic thing of endosymbiosis between a bunch of symbiotes that we all are getting together and for the benefit of the species. And I'll leave you guys with that. And good night. Thank you, Steve. Thank good night. You. Awesome. Good night. Good night, Dad. I'd like to just take a moment to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above, Ben Tobin, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Spinkter of Doom, and The Venerable Bee. My channel members and patrons help make this a much more stable income, because as you might know, ad income varies wildly from month to month, even with the same number of views. And it really helps this channel stay on the air. But if a monthly pledge or a yearly pledge, which I have now activated, isn't right for you, there's a merch store linked in the description, and every like, share, and subscription really helps the channel grow. Also, those pledging $10 or above will have access to free 3D art assets, including materials and models, which will be made for Blender by me and can be used in any project without crediting me. Appreciate you.